Welcome to the Voodoo Power Podcast. Welcome to Plates and Pancakes. We're sitting down today with Adam Vogel. Coach Vogel is the department chair, PE teacher, and strength conditioning coach at Homewood Flossmoor High School. Prior to his move there, he served as a physical education teacher, PE, CTE division chair, head strength coach, and assistant football coach at Bradley Bourbon A Community High School. He has been featured in Simply Faster and is a contributor to the TFC, presenting recently in Chicago. He is a former collegiate football player and has a BS in psychology and a master's degree in teaching. Coach Vogel holds USAW1 and NASM Youth Exercise Specialist certifications and is the Illinois State Director for the National High School Strength Coaches Association. So welcome to the show, Coach. Hey, thanks for having me on, Coach. I'm excited about uh, getting a chance to talk shop with you and uh, extremely uh, grateful for this opportunity. Man, I've been excited about it. I, you know, for the listeners, uh, I think it was Friday night. We were texting back and forth and talking about ideas, and that turned into uh, quite a lengthy phone call. So I took some notes from that, and hopefully we can dig into it. Nice. Now, where you're at now, you do a lot of VBT. You work with a lot of velocities. Mm -hmm. Will you take them clear up to really slow velocities, a point three? Where, what are you looking for? Yeah. So, um, it depends on, so it depends on what we're doing. So I've done lossy based training since 2015, I believe. And, uh, so I've used almost every, almost every device out there at some point, uh, trying it out, seeing which one was the best fit for our school. And so when it comes to velocities, a lot of times when we do, when we start with our, we'll start doing velocity with our sophomores. Um, I would eventually like to get it in with our freshmen but I'm worried about their movement patterns first. I'm not really worried about the velocity that they're moving. Uh, and I, I talk more about that in a minute, but uh, with the velocity we start out with is I want them to be between 0.3 and 0.5. And so typically we're doing reps somewhere between the range of three to five reps, sometimes six reps when we start getting into that type of velocity. Um, so that's somewhere between 85 to 90% of their max, 80 to 90% of their max when we're doing our uh, 0.3 and 0.5 meters per second. I will let them drop below that if we're out of season and we're doing like a end of the end of the semester like i don't really we don't really do like a max week but like i'll let them fall below that if if they if they have good technique um but usually what will happen then is if it's that last rep that they hit like 0 0.24 0 0.29 i'll have them rack the bar even if they have like one rep left like we do a lot of three rms um and so when we do that well that's when i kind of come off i'll explain to them like hey for this, so I want you about 0.3. That transfers a little bit better to what we want to see as far as where their strength's at. Um, it's not that I don't want them to not grind it out, but I want them to understand what we're trying to, what what we're working for uh, absolute or circa max strength and not just absolute strength or maximal strength. Um, the other part of that too is we, we will do eccentrics and isometrics. So they are getting things that are below 0.3 meters per second, but that's just not the training phase that we'd be in with those, with those athletes at that time. Okay, so let's go back to circa max. Because the way I view it is is maybe a little bit different than you. Mm -hmm. So in a conjugate system, in a West Side conjugate, what Louie had is you would you would build that up to increasingly heavy weights. Running a velocity style system and you don't want to drop below three, how does that work in the circa max phase? Yeah. So when we're in circa max and we're not dropping below point three, I want them to be able to repeat their max effort more than once because most sports are going to have to repeat that max effort unless you talk about throwers which throwers i'm being a lot more lenient with or uh, a lot of times defensive tackles and like the inside linemen i'm more okay with that because they're kind of in an isometric when you think about how they're with how they're driving back and forth with the, with the uh, opponent so those are the things where I'm, where I'm a little bit more lenient about that but uh if you look at like sport it's not very often that you're going to see a wide receiver or any other sport like a soccer player that's going to need the demands for maximal strength. Like they would for like possibly a defensive tackle or a thrower or something like that. So that's kind of why, why I kind of go along those lines. Um, and like I said, we still touch on it. We're just not going to focus on it. Right. So we, depending on their training age and what phase of development they're in, we'll touch on everything. So there's a thread of everything in, in what we do. So speed wise, plyometrics, power based stuff, um, all the different velocities that we, that we have within like, uh, the, uh, strength velocity curve. However, we want to focus on one thing at a time because otherwise we're just chasing a bunch of targets and I just want them to focus on hitting one target at a time. Okay, so let's flip that the other way around. Uh -huh. how, how fast will you allow them to go in explosive work if we're talking strength curve 
uh, before you want to start adding on the bar? You want to be up at 0.9, 1.2. What do you want to see top speed wise on your VBT before you start looking at adding on? So we first we actually we look at building a uh, foundation of strength. So I actually care about them going 0.3 to 0.5 first because. Uh, I liken it to uh, swinging a baseball bat, right, with a wiffle bat. If I have a wiffle ball bat, I can swing that really fast, right? And if my body's the actual wiffle ball bat, that bat is not going to hit home runs no matter how fast I swing it because there's no strength behind the, uh, the 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 actual bat. So I need to get that bat to be to a certain strength. So we need to get that bat to be 34, 36 ounces, right? So once we build that strength, now I can I can swing that bat at the same speed I could swing a wiffle ball bat, I can get an exit below of 100, hit a home run, right? And so that's what we want the, our athletes to do. So we have to build the foundation first. And so we kind of, like how we do our phases of development is it's first movement priority. So we're still going to do a lot of different things, work on strength, but we're not tracking strength. So we're focusing on the range of motion and their movement patterns that, uh, that, that we need to groove and get ready so that we can start to build a foundation of strength. And that typically starts their freshman year. And so... That's going to be anywhere from if, it, if it's an athlete that might have like lifted their dad or might have done some training in junior high, it could be anywhere from two to six weeks, or it could be as long as three to six months. Um, typically, it's about it's for our athletes it's about two and a half to four months, so about a semester. And as as we're doing that with most of those athletes, even though they're moving, working movement patterns, and we can talk about the rep step schemes later, but uh, we will add weight if we see that their movement patterns good, right? So it's not like they have to just do body weight the whole time. We'll individualize that for those athletes. And then, then we'll spend most of our time in that strength phase where we're prioritizing, prioritizing strength with that 0.3 to 0.5. And I'll talk about how we can use all the different threads, but going back to your question is like, we'll, we'll work because we, we teach them how to do cleans. Um, we haven't taught this. I'm at a new school now, so we haven't taught them how to do snatches and jerks yet, but they're getting, uh, they're getting peak power, peak force and peak, uh, rate of force development doing doing uh, cleans at uh, about 1.65 to 2.0 meters per second, which is pretty fast. And then when we're doing our plyometrics, they're moving anywhere from uh, 2 to 2.5 meters per second. And then uh, when we're doing our sprinting and uh, change of direction type work, they could be getting up as high as 6 or 7 meters per second. Okay, so do you work in a block style system? So once the strength is where you want it, do you focus on speed? Yeah, so I, I, it depends on the, again, on development. I call it more of like a modified block. So freshmen, we're going to do a lot of the, our block is going to be a lot of one by 20. Okay. And we're going to do a lot of Dr. Yessi stuff. But then once I, I don't have the patience for it. So we milk it as long as I can handle it or as long as our coaches can handle it. And then we start to go into like a more traditional linear block with those freshmen and early sophomores if they're out of season. So then we'll do a little bit of like, we'll, we'll do a little hypertrophy by doing some three by tens or four by tens. And then we'll go into three by fives, three by threes, and we'll start to bring that percentage down and then we'll bring it back up. And then we'll put in some phases of ISOs. Like, so we'll kind of rob some of a uh, Cal deep stuff and put like a two week ISO, uh, ISO phase or two week eccentric phase. Um, it's really been more eccentrics lately. Cause I found that I like max. I like putting the ISOs when we're doing the one by twenties after we do those, uh, do a set of like, let's say we do a set of 20 on split squats. Then we'll do a set of scissor jumps or uh, switches um, for for 10 to 20. And then we'll do a set of uh, isometrics where they're in a split lunge. And so when we ho have to hold that for 45 seconds to a minute, that makes it really difficult. And they really feel that burn then, right? So we know we're still building strength. We know we're still getting that uh, hypertrophy by adding those little elements onto it after the one by 20. Because real, I don't really feel like we're building a lot of hypertrophy with the one by 20 for those athletes that need it. Uh, but then when we get into this, when we get into our, like in the uh, middle of us uh, freshman year into sophomore year, now we're going to start working on the strength. So, so if they're in season and we're working on strength, then they'll have three days a week that we're working on strength, me meaning that our main, our four lifts are going to be somewhere between 80, 90% at 0.3 to 0.5 meters per second. If they're, so that's if they're out of season, if they're in season, we'll have one day or two days of strength based on how many games they have that week. And then the other day will either be speed strength or game day workout based on um, and game day workout is just doing starting strength. So everything that's like 1.30 and above. So with your speed strength, are you staying around that 70, 65 to 75% range? Is that what you're looking for? No, I actually have to go lighter than that. So we go like a uh, 60%, uh, between 50 and 60% typically. Some of them will have to drop down to 40 if they don't have the, if they don't have the strength phase built up yet and they're in season because they just can't move the bar fast enough. So 
Um, so like that goes back to the wiffle bat. Hey, we're at about a 32 ounce bat. We, we need so that's why I still have that, that day of strength in there because we still need to get that strength up. And I also don't want them to lose that quality either. And so with the, um, we actually try to hit about 1.0 meters per second between 0.9 to 1.0, which is about, uh, that 40 to 60%. Uh, but usually it's about 50 to 60 for most of our athletes. And, uh, that's a lot, that's where like peak power happens for, uh, traditional lifts. Now, if we're doing a clean, I want to see him hit it at 1.65. I got this from Paul comfort. Um, they, uh, he had a great lecture that he was doing in the United Kingdom about, uh, peak force, peak power, and peak rate of force development all happen on a clean or a clean pull at 1.65 meters per second. So I really want to see them try to hit that when we're, when we're working on that. And then if they're working more on technique, we'll be either at uh, 1.75 or 2.0, or if we're working on a max for clean or trying to get heavier on clean, we'll go, we'll look for more like 1.35 to 1.5 and all. So you're floating right there on, uh, the strength velocity curve. You're right in between explosive and Let's see, speed strength. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're you're you're, strength, you're kind of split right on that line of right. Speed, strength, strength, speed. So we're on the high end, high end of Louis Simmons' uh, dynamic effort uh, for uh, strength speed, but we're on the low end for speed strength, which is more like what you'd see with more athletes, right? Right. I'm kind of, I'm with you there to a certain extent, and then we differ. And yeah, for 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 people that don't know, it's going to probably sound like I'm arguing with him, but we hashed all this out we solved all the world's <laughs> problems uh saturday night so now we're just we're coming back around to some of that so i get where you're at with uh speed strength mm -hmm. but as you drop down in the percentages you start hitting that explosive strength so you're actually riding that that 40 45 50 you know you're just riding that bubble yes. right there from ballistic to dynamic yes and what you call and so what you call ballistic is what i think i call speed strength and what you call um, explosive, right? Explosive slower for you or ballistics faster and slower for you? Ballistics are faster. So, yeah, so that's speed strength, what I'm calling speed strength. And then explosive is what I'm is what I'm calling strength speed. Okay. So we're totally different on, on terms. So when I say strength speed, I'm thinking heavyweight slow. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I think speed strength, I'm thinking... 65 to 80 percent fast and when i say explosive strength i'm thinking 30 to 55 percent okay. that's what i call fast strength. yeah okay so now we, we've come to that that's going to help a lot as we continue yeah, to discuss this so at least for so that's uh, why i don't like that's why I like i love percentages for the for the framework but then when you start seeing athletes use it you're like oh crap like like this kid's at 40 percent, he should be at 55 or 60 right and so like that's a huge difference when we're talking about percentages especially if their max is over over 250 or over 300 even right like if you got a 400 pound max you know i mean 20 percent it's huge right right and then we touched on ballistic there so my definition of ballistic is it's not as fast as a plyometric but it's not as slow as explosive so take dan fichter's plate drop yes that's ballistic when you catch it and you come back up yeah absolutely uh, so yeah, and I've seen a lot of success down there at that explosive range, which you're calling uh, speed strength. And that mm -hmm. forty, and that forty, and that forty range, people discount it, but the reversal strength at the bottom is so big that you can have some huge carryover in athletes that you see on the field very quickly. Yeah, and that the the those the speed that we probably don't touch on the most is the accelerative strength, which is at point six five to point seven five especially if they're in season because that's that that's that hypertrophy phase where you feel a pump you're a bodybuilder type right and we don't want our athletes moving into that middle ground so hey we're gonna either move really heavy and it's gonna look slow or we're gonna move lighter and it's gonna look fast right so um we actually made the mistake of doing this with uh our our, our football team and i'll take the blame for it is on days that we were going heavy for our for our uh, circa max strength on like a monday or tuesday they were going too light and because they were worried about getting sore. Okay, I'm still building that trust with them. Versus on the light fast days, they're going too heavy because they felt, well, I feel pretty good now. I didn't have to go as heavy earlier in the week, right? And so we're living this limbo. I, I literally tell people that's where athletes go to die. Like if you're in season, we're not, I'm not one of, I don't want to, I don't want to work on hypertrophy during that time unless you're not a starter, right? Like we have other qualities that we need to get to the field for you. Yeah, you have to define where you want to be on that strength curve and live in there at, uh, in season hypertrophy 
you might do a little bit to maintain because you have so right. many days that you're going to maintain it. But if that's where you're living, I get what you're saying. And then what happens is your guys slow down velocities because they're more worried about sets and reps. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. Well, now that we're down this road a little bit, I'll go into this question. You're a speed guy, but you're also a strength guy. You, you enjoy both qualities. I love both qualities. Yeah. And I agree with that. But what I'm wondering is, as we're putting more focus on how fast these football guys are on the field, how long before that turns into a mass-specific athlete and we leave armor behind to create a faster player? And what are the consequences of possibly doing that? Yeah, that's a big fear too, right? Because we need we need our student athletes, especially our football players. We're going to talk about football for this for, for, for that sake or wrestlers, depending. But wrestlers are a little bit different because a little bit different demands. I got weight classes to kind of help them with the body armor. But we talk about body armor for football players. The big thing is that we got to get them through at least nine games and then another another four or five, depending on what your playoff system looks like in high school, which means that they're basically playing 15. They're playing 15 plus in college now. You know, uh, NFL, they're playing what, somewhere like what, uh, 23 or something like that, 24. So that's a lot of weeks of uh, banging. That's a lot of weeks of collision and contact. And we, we think about, oh, well, it's, well, it's 15 games possibly. You got to add all those practices in. You got to add the, the 20, we have 23 non, I think it's 23 non contact days in Illinois or 25, uh, or sorry, uh, contact days in Illinois. And then you also got to add the preseason. So you got a lot of football there basically from June until the middle or end of November. So we got to build that up. And so, like you're saying with that, that's why, like, like I want to see multi sport athletes, but that's why you see like uh, track athletes that are elite track athletes that's a skill in itself and they can't they they don't have they don't have the wherewithal to be able to handle that type of uh contact and collision for an entire season typically typically i'm not there's outliers for everything but like with a football player that's why you don't see me as being as fast or as elite as a as a an elite sprinter because they have to have that body armor to protect themselves so our our big thing is making sure that they that we can try to get them to 28 miles an hour plus are, we're going to continue to try to drive that speed up as we go, but we know that like, hey, they're going to be pretty fast uh, football player if they're hitting their mean velocity at 20 miles per hour, uh, which means they're probably somewhere between 21 to 21 and a half at peak velocity. That's without pads. Um, and we're going to continue to drive that up, but we do have to make sure that they're safe and, that, and then that, and they can handle the handle the contact. Uh, and so it's that's where it becomes difficult for like a track football athlete in the fact that like, hey, we want to make them as fast as we can, but we also don't want to we don't all, we don't want to make them too big to where they they don't help the position so that's a good meeting that we have with us with the football coaches and, and the track coaches and things like that we're like like we have a couple of running backs right now we have one that we need to bulk up we have another running back we need to lean down a little bit right because he's he's starting to get a little bit on the on the heavy side and so his velocity is going down even though he's cleaning he's cleaning two uh, i think he's cleaning 265 or 270 like uh so he has the strength but we got to make sure that we keep him lean whereas the other one He's cleaning about 205. We need to work on his strength and uh, his speed. Not that his speed is, a, is is fine, but like we always want to make him faster. And I think where this shows up is you brought up wrestling, yeah. Gr girls wrestling. I think you see a lot of mat contact injuries because the armor on the female athlete doesn't exist like it does the male. So if you take that across, then we start cutting down the size of our our football players i think we're going to see more shoulder upper body injuries but i don't know that's just something i think about and bounce it off you and see what your thoughts are uh, you can see some of that too like and they're, they're uh like wrestling for for females is pretty new still right so there's some there's some issues there as far as like um uh like like you talked about like the, the thing that's different between male and female athletes and i'll get into wrestling here in a second is that they typically have longer better endurance right especially with the upper body and then they lack a little bit more of this, uh, the the maximal strength in the lower body, um, and so when you're looking at that from when you're looking at that type of athlete for wrestling, like they're going to be able to be they're going to be able to have the endurance to go the whole match, but you're not going to see that as, as much of that explosive, uh, explosive like type of takedowns and shots, right? And so um, when a girl does get slammed, one they're not used to it, right? Um, they're also they don't have this, they don't have the muscle density that a, that a male would typically have either. So now you're, now you're putting two, two risk factors into one that could possibly be a, a chance for injury. Right. And so, um, 
that's where that, that I guess that's where that would kind of fall wouldn't you say I agree I think that learning I think you hit on it right in there that learning curve is learning curve is very steep mm -hmm. so girls wanted to wrestle and by all means they should be able to wrestle and I believe yeah. they should be able to wrestle each other but yeah. now as a strength and conditioning coach you've got to figure out where the injury is most likely to happen and hurry up and start building that athlete and that's what makes me nervous about girls wrestling is you see so many injuries how long is it before people start saying we'll see the injury rate's so high we need to get rid of this well, instead of saying we need to develop the athlete for what we're trying to do so give us a little more time yeah yeah i, I mean like typically it's uh i mean with them when i see injuries it's typically shoulder and uh and wrist so like upper body like we talked about um the good thing about shoulder and wrist they're not out as long as like if they if it was a knee or a or an ankle or hip um but the other side too is what i found kind of interesting is i haven't seen a lot of um i haven't seen a number of more concussions in wrestling than i have in girls soccer or even girls cheerleading so um i i hope that they don't use that as an excuse to try to get rid of something that's i think a really good thing for a lot of uh a lot of our female athletes and and females in general right like uh we talk about wanting america to be tough again and want people to be tough again and things like that we have we have some great girls doing a really tough tough sport um and i and it's and it is a contact sport uh and kind of keep going around with this like like water polo we have guys and girls water polo we got guys and girls lacrosse um i know that uh uh girls football is starting to kind of make a little bit of a push now too we got girls rugby so um i, I hope no one picks on picks on wrestling so it's such a great sport and uh, I think when when you have both sexes playing the same sport, it builds better families when they have kids down the road to continue to play multiple sports and continue to um, get get both sexes involved in sports. Now, you brought up something I haven't talked about a whole lot on the show, but this is a question I've been wondering about. You talked concussions. Mm -hmm. We're exposing young kids, you know, second, third grade to some monster hits in football. And then now all of a sudden across the country, I think you're seeing, at least in the Midwest, you're seeing a drop off in football players. Mm -hmm. Are we overexposing these really young kids to monstrous hits that are taking them out of the game later on in high school? Because they, you know, they set something in there and they can't get over that. They don't realize now that they're 6'2", 240, they still remember being first grade and some big kid trucked them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I definitely think there's, there, there can be a, there can be a trauma to it, right? Especially if it's not under controlled setting. Uh, I'm no expert by, by me, by any means with, with concussions and like what, the, what doctors and scientists have seen with like sub concussions, right. Or sub hits that can lead into concussive, uh, bigger concussions later. Um, I'm like, like I got my own son. Um, he's not playing football yet. He's in first grade. Uh, and it's just, it's just because I want him to want to want to play and he's not really interested in wanting to play yet, but he wrestles. Right. So uh, that's, that's, that's kind of where, where I'm at with my son. But like when it comes to everybody else, uh, one thing we do need to remember if they do, if you do choose to play football at a young age, we're talking about velocity, you're not running as fast. So the, so the collision isn't going to be as, as, uh, uh, major, like when we talk about monstrous, I would say it's not necessarily monstrous. Now, if you have a fourth grader going against an eighth grader, that'd be monstrous, right? Especially if there's small, if this fourth grader is a lot smaller than the eighth grader, things like that. Um, but I think we just got to be smart about it. I think that uh, USA football has done some really good things about changing the uh, size of the field a little bit to make sure that they're not having those high speed collisions at those lower levels because it, it's still a collision. Let's not forget that it's still a collision. It's a collision when they when they uh, when they come off the line of scrimmage too, right? So it doesn't mean that they have to have their head hit another helmet or their or, or have their uh, helmet hit the ground. Uh, that jarring can still happen just from the collision of the two shoulder uh, hands hitting the shoulders. And then that head's jerking back. So uh, we know that we know that, that those things are happening. Um, it's I don't know. I, I I like contact sports. I've always been into contact sports. And so I think the biggest thing that we can do is we know there's risk with everything. I mean, we know we can get a concussion ride riding in a car or, or riding our bike and falling off of it. So um, there's inherent risk with every, everything we do. We just want to be smart about the risks that we take. And then we also want to make sure that, like, we want kids to be able to do the things that they love to do. I, I would hate to, like, govern all that all that type of stuff if, like and i'm not saying like if kid doesn't want to if kid's not into contact that's fine they're not into contact but some kids like i don't know how i would got through life or school if i wasn't if i didn't have a way to take out my aggression <laughs> and i agree with that 100 percent. and i love the contact sport i'm just wondering if we're seeing a better athlete because we're starting them at contact at second and third grade 
than we yeah. were 20 years ago when we were starting them at junior high. Yeah, I don't know if we're seeing a better. That's a tough one because there's things that are going into societal, right? Like, like we're used to growing up and playing multiple sports, which uh, I still encourage. I think is is really good. But then you're also seeing like there's some sports where like if you don't if you don't start early, you're going to be an up the hill battle. I'm not saying it's impossible, you know, but like gymnastics, for example, like you you have to start that pretty early because you also get you got to not have that fear of landing on your head when you do it when you're doing a uh, a standing full or something, right? So um, there there's 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 that there's that part of the mental the mental side of it, right? And then we also have like with the with uh, society is we're not having as many kids as we used to. And so, and we're having them at a later period of time. So if we're doing those types of things, we're going to be more protective of the kids that we have because we don't have as many of them. And we're a little bit, we're a little bit more um, conscious of the gravity of the decisions that our kids could possibly make uh, growing up. But we also have to understand too, by us trying to protect our kids all the time, we're also not preparing for the real world. We're also uh, not necessarily uh, giving them the chance to make mistakes and learn from the mistakes that we did as kids, right? Like falling off of our bikes or uh, like, I remember being a kid and we were, we were riding on my uncle's hogs and, and uh, cows trying to hang out, right? Like just doing stupid kid stuff, jumping off the roof of my garage, you know? So, and that wasn't a sport. We just thought it was fun. And you do bring up a good point. Some sports do need early involvement. I, I tell young kids all the time, if I had to pick at a young age between wrestling and basketball, I would pick wrestling because you need that education. You can pick up basketball. I don't want to shortchange it for any basketball coach that might be listening, but you can pick up basketball rather quickly. So choose the sport that's going to benefit you in the long run through knowledge. And then when you get in junior high and high school, then you can pick what you want to do, but at least you have the background. Yeah. And I think some of those things like feed off each other too, like basketball and soccer marry really well together. Um, track marries with everything. I mean, uh, and then we got to think about the social aspects too. Like all those are team games, right? And so those team games, uh, do really well together, but then there's something about like wrestling or golf or tennis where, Hey, it's, you're on your own, you know, like how do you handle that? Right. Being the only spotlight and there's nobody to, there's nobody to blame. There's nobody to say, like, to, to say, Oh, well, if I would have, if he would have done this, it would have helped. We would have won or anything like that. So, um, it's a fun combination, isn't it? I mean, like, that's why I like multiple sport athletes. I like, I understand why today's society we're, we're more singular. Um, it's just harder to, it's, it's harder to get kids to play multiple sports because of the way that the system is made, which is fine. Um, and we're seeing some great athletes that are single sport athletes. We just gotta be more conscious of the overuse injuries, right? We have to be more conscious of, um, their pitch counts and throw counts. We gotta be more conscious of their jumps. We got to be more conscious of uh, how much they're doing repetitively. I mean, like, we we act like it's a new thing with baseball. It's been in swim forever, you know, so. All right, kind of getting back to the weights. We had yeah, talked. let's go. <laughs> we, 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 I don't even know how we got down that rabbit hole, but let's get back to where we were. So me and you talked about this the other day, and you, you made me think about this, and I'd never thought about it this way. You use bands. You use accommodating resistance. After thinking about it a little bit, are accommodating resistance neurological, or is it strength, or is it both? Yeah, you're, you're, we're going down something crazy here. I think it's both. I don't know the science as much behind uh, about behind accommodating resistance. Most of the accommodating resistance that I use is bands, so I don't use a lot of chains. Uh, I like chains; they're cool. They look great. Um, I just feel like the bands we get more out of it because I do think there's more of a neurological component of having to overcome the res the constant resistance as opposed to like a melodic resistance with the chain right because uh it's one uh link at a time as opposed to the band is always there it doesn't it doesn't ever change um it's but uh the part that i think that that is a little bit uh of a of a physiological uh part of it is that you are adding more resistance in the parts of the curve that you struggle with and we're talking about a different curve right we're talking about like hey if i'm coming out of a a, a squat it's easier at the top end. So how can I train that if I don't want to do partials, right? So that's a really good way of doing that. Uh, the other the other thing though, from a neurological sense though, is you have to come out of that hole fast or you're never going to, that bands are just going to pull you right back down, especially if you use heavy bands. Like you're using, if you're using some of the greens or the, or the purples even, like those things can bury you if you're not, if you don't know what you're doing. And then the other benefit you get out of them is the overspeed. Yes. So 
you can travel faster than you normally would. So now your reversal strength at the bottom grows. And then you add that neurological component in where you have to fire out of that fast enough or you're never going to make it. So I see how it could fall both ways in, in both categories. The question that I get to is like, well, when do you start using bands with kids? You know, and I think it really depends on what you're doing because there's a lot of exercise you can do with bands. It also depends on what you're, what you're trying to, what you're trying to train. I'd be interested in your thoughts on it too. But like, I typically won't put bands on a barbell until they start to plateau when it comes to their power development, when we're doing like 1.0 meters per second for our speed strength, that's when we start to put bands on there. Like, okay, they're getting, they're getting stuck at their 1.0. Let's say they got, uh, I don't know, 145 on the bar. Well, we can't, we're not moving it past. They're, they're, we're kind of stuck there for two or three weeks. Okay. Let's throw some bands on. And then I'll, we'll bring the weight down. We'll make the, the bands accommodate for the for the, the weight that we brought down. And then we'll just say, say look, you're going to do the bands for the next three weeks. And every time you hit 1.0 or above, I'm sorry, above 1.0, we'll add five pounds. So if you hit 105, we'll put a five on each side. We'll keep the, and I like using the red mini bands for that. And then we'll go to the, then we'll keep them up that way. Next thing you know, we go back to 145, three weeks from then. And they're, and that's like easy for them. They're up to like 160, 165. Usually it's about a 15 to 25 pound uh, increase that I've seen in about three to four weeks. Now, if they've never done it before, right? It's new to them. It's a new stimulus. It's like it's like it's like free strength. So, we wave it, and we'll talk two different styles of bands. Yeah. So, if if I'm down there in that explosive dynamic area, so we're looking at anywhere from forty to sixty percent, I'm going to keep a pretty light band on there. I I only want to look at maybe twenty percent adding at the top. Yeah. So so it's just enough to change the exercise. A little bit they're not getting this huge jerk down right. now if we're if we start talking heavy bands like you were talking a minute ago on some of those you have to be in my mind very selective on when you do that and hitting a circumax phase because you will wreck a kid for a hundred percent for a month oh, yeah. yeah oh yeah oh yeah and, and you know what we, we did it a lot in college cause we did conjugate in college um i've never done the heavy bands for a squat or a bench with my uh uh, high school kids that I'm, that I can think of. I'm trying to think if I've ever had like a one-off type kid that might've been able to handle it. Not that I can recall, but we would use the heavy bands for like RDLs, uh, or sorry, not RDLs for uh, good mornings and for hip thrust. Um, so I like to use it for those types of things. We'd also use it for any sort of like resisted runs. We might use the greens or even the grays, um, for, for some things like that, where the, vlo like the velocity is supposed to be faster and we're going to bring the velocity down purposefully. Right. So like you said, if you put in, green bands on a kid that's never done band work before um now the cool thing is if you do a couple do, do no weight on the bar and you just have the greens and you and you start to learn to squat with them a little bit um i love using that as my warm up for like a max day yeah now now we're starting to talk a little bit different of a scenario but how i learned about the heavy bands wrecking you so bad was we kind of run i hate to say it's reverse five three one but it kind of is so we would always figure out what our 95% was. And then the rest of the mm -hmm. cycle would do that. Well, we tried to do the same thing with bands. So we were going to, we, you know what I mean? So <laughs> you, you hit your 95 with bands. And then, so you come back for your next cycle, which is a, a five by five. Yeah. You, you can't do it. Yeah. You can't, you can't hit the numbers that you were supposed to hit because you're so trashed from the one rep. Yeah. And when you say that, I, I would say that's where it probably is more neurological, right? Like, your CNS it hasn't recovered yet when you do something crazy like that because um, that pressure is constant. Like it's not, there's no, there's no, there's no escaping it. I guess. I mean, uh, I don't have a better word for it than just like it's it's a constant pressure, and so you're you're firing those motor neurons are firing the entire range of motion on the eccentric, where the eccentric actually feels a little bit easier, whereas usually the concentric feels easier. And there's you, your brain gets tricked at saying like, there's no way out. Like I just got to get it to the, to the pins. Yeah. And from the time you unrack to the time you finish, it'll jerk you off balance. It'll, I mean, it'll crush mm -hmm. you if them band tensions aren't right. So we don't do a whole lot of that just because of the toll it takes. Now, if we were power lifters and we were looking at really building up somebody's squat, we would probably do that more. But we stay pretty light with the bands and use them for our speed work. When you when you did your training, you, would you typically do like the heavy bands with like box squats? That's typically what we when we would do it, um, because at least you kind of even though you're not really sitting on the box, it kind of just felt safer. I don't know. Yes, because you you need something there 
because if if something goes wrong and you either get jerked into the ground or you can't come up, you're in a pretty vulnerable spot. So, and the pins usually don't work because that's where your band's going to fall. Yeah. I haven't done this in a long time. I like doing the bands for assisted, the heavy bands for assisted. So they can feel the weight on their back, but then it unloads as they're going down. Right. So like, uh, but I haven't done that with high school kids ever. That's, I remember doing that myself in my training. That was kind of, that was always kind of a fun day, you know, when we were doing those types of things. So are you talking like a lighting method? So let's say you're squatting and you hook uh, the bands to the top of the rack. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And we'll do that. Like if we're getting ready for a meet and yeah. then, then a kid can get where he's handling what should be maybe his last attempt. Yeah. But, he, but he's getting huge help out of the hole. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We don't like, I had a power lifting team last, well, no, two years ago, but we, those are, those are first year having power, starting power lifting. So we didn't do that with them, but that's something that, that would be a great time to do that. So they feel the weight, but they're not going to, so they're, especially what, about a week out, like they, that, they get, they get to feel the weight, what it's going to feel like on their back, mentally get prepared, but they're not having to put the work into it. And the mental part is really a key component to it all too, because they can start seeing the weight on the bar. Yeah. You yeah. know, if, if you walk up and you're, you're taking your last attempt, you've never seen that much weight on the bar. You've never felt what that feels, feels like Yeah, it's going to throw them off or at least you can do it this way. It's somewhat controlled and they can start getting a feel for it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this is the one we talked about a lot, and this will go back to this box squat that we touched on a little bit too, but uh, the depth drop is a maximal effort lift, essentially. Mm -hmm. When you come off that box, w whatever you determine the height is, is, in my mind, now we can, we can debate this, in my mind, the second you see the ankle give, knee vulgus, a hip issue or the body refuses to accept the force. So they're not sticking that landing like a gymnast. Yep. You're at your one rep max. Yeah. I would, I would agree with that. I, I don't look at it like, I don't look at it the same way that way, but I agree with it hundred percent. So, um, typically how do we figure out our depth drop height is I'll usually tell them that when I'm a couple inches higher than whatever their, whatever their max, uh, vertical is. So if they're a 24 inch vertical, let's try to get a 28 or 30 inch box to start off of. And then let's see how they land off of it. And so um, I'll usually start that way and then work them backwards to the, to the box that they jumped off of. Usually that's about the right height. And then I'll try to push them up a little bit further. And like you said, okay, no, that's too much. We got to go back down. Uh, there's a video you and I were talking about that I had where the one kid sticked it perfect. I found the video, by the way. And then the other the other kid, his knee went, caved in a little bit, went a little bit valgus. And so we backed them back down another box. Okay, so... Um, we're not dropping off. We're not, I mean, the, those, the heights they are dropping off aren't insane. They're all like 40 inches or less. Um, if I, once they can get to like 40 inches, then, then, then you start talking about like, okay, you better really be watching. Cause there is a chance then of somebody to get hurt. Um, and I, and I'm real, we're really careful about that. Like, I, like to me, that's like, like I do an Olympic lift in a lot of ways. I'm not watching. Hey, we're doing our, that's a, like not our main lift, but like, let's say they're doing RDLs at their main lift or they're doing split squats at their main lift. I know what they're doing there. They got pins set up. They're safe doing what they're doing. When we're doing our when we're doing our uh, drops, especially the first couple times, I'm watching every rep because I want to make sure that the kids understand what we're getting out of that because it is eccentric, right? But it's it's more of like a some would call it a rapid eccentric. I like I just look at it as like basically eccentric rate of force development, right? Where they got to learn how to not only absorb but break. So I want them to be able to like absorb the force means they can still go down. They're going to take it in. Right. And they, so like, you're talking about the energy leaks, you might see that I'm thinking like, I want to see the brakes put on so that you're like, if we had a force plate underneath you, you're on waiting before you even land, but you're landing stiff at the same time so that you could re you can re uh, use that energy to go vertical or horizontal. Right. Yeah. And so the higher you jump, the longer it takes to reverse, like you said. So then you have to start weighing out where you could benefit more under the bar than you are the boxes because of the time it takes for your reversal strength. Yes. And so when we look at that, what I, what I'll do is we'll go, like we just finished up a, a block of our depth drops like that. And so now we'll go start going into depth drops into a broad jump or into a vertical jump or onto another box. And so I'll take uh, our, our uh, switch mats, our pile mats and uh, sky hooks, and we'll put those down. And then if they're not fast enough off the box, they go to a lower box, right? Because 
I know they can jump on the box high enough, but I want to be like usually about between 200 to 250 millis, uh, uh, milliseconds off the ground. So if you're hitting, if you're not getting off the ground quick enough, then the box is too high for you. Now, we'll go back to the neurological com component that you hear Corfist and Victor and all those guys talk about. So you got to be able to land the height before you can jump the height. Now, now we're talking about leaks. So what the body accepts and what it doesn't accept from those heights. Mm -hmm. How do you shore up the weak spots so that you can start taking a higher depth drop so that you can jump higher? Yeah. So typically if, if we're doing like, so typically when we're doing the, the, the ground contact time is short like that. Typically I see the leakage in the ankle first. I might be wrong, but that's typically where I see it. So I like to pair a lot of that stuff with a lot of the spring ankle isometrics. And so I really, really like the low, the low knee isometric for that. Um, and building that up first, uh, Corpus has turned me on to some good stuff. He's at, if you guys don't know, he's, he's our sprint coach. I I'm lucky. I'm so fortunate. He's our sprint coach. Nate Deavy's our head, our head track coach. Um, and then we have, uh, uh, Rob Assis is our is our jumps coach, and then on the girls' side we have a, another unbelievable staff. Uh, Tyrone Green's our coach, uh, phenomenal girls' track coach, and uh, and like we have phenomenal girls' throws coach, jumps coach. It's crazy. So um, he anyway going back to uh, Corfest, he he uh, I remember reading an article about foot strength before because I think it's more than just the ankle. We also have the foot, and there's so many bones in there, and we know that that's a that's also another hinge, right? So. We're going to do some more stuff come January here. We're really working on strengthening the foot because maybe the ankle's showing it, but it might be the foot that's that's being the leakage. Because if that's heels dropping, I'm wondering if that's a foot issue as opposed to an ankle issue. And then if we see, so so we're going to continue to do our our spring ankle isos, and then we're going to do some we're going to do some foot strengthening uh, as well uh, with that. Which I'll post some stuff once we kind of get that all figured out. Um, and then, and then when it goes to like the higher drops that you and I, that you and I were just talking about recently, that's where I typically see like the knee valgus, okay, or we'll see the hip, right? And so with the knee valgus, a lot of times it's just a simple cue. Hey, did you know that you're, did you feel your knee coming in? Oh, I did coach, especially with our female athletes. I'm like, hey, let's see if you keep the knee over the toe. If they can keep the knee over the toe just by giving them a cue, by asking them a question like that, then I don't feel the need to do anything further. If I do, do see an issue still, then we'll put like a mini band when they're doing their squats or we'll, uh, We'll do a little bit of glute me, but I don't know if it's always a glute me being the issue. I think sometimes it's just um, the anatomy of how they land. And so I think it might be more of the foot, the ankle, and the positioning of it than if if the glute meat is firing. Okay. When you're talking about mini band, are you talking about putting it uh, above their knees? Yeah. And, the and band. It, yeah. And letting, yeah. It dr letting them drive into it and yeah. trying, to, trying to strengthen that abductor. Okay. Yeah. I want the one. I, I, I typically start above the knee and then I'll work below the knee. And then I'll remove it. And I don't do it a lot because you typically, I mean, when I say I don't do a lot, I don't need to need to use it a lot is what I'm saying. Like uh, uh, maybe one or two athletes out of every 40, 50, you know, um, uh, with with that. Uh, I, I am interested though, have you seen the lead FTS bands that are like the cotton version of that? No, I haven't. I need to look into them. I want to look at those because the one thing I hate about the therapy bands is they wear out so fast. You know what I mean? Like, I just bought what we have. Or we have the... The cheap ones, like uh, you can buy on Amazon, yeah, that are, yeah. That are real wide, almost like uh, almost like hip circles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll throw them in in a winning warm up. So we'll do four sets of twenty five, no weight, just yeah, air, drive the knee out, set, drive the knee out to come back up, and yeah. you'll toast some kids. You oh got, yeah, you got to be careful how much you're doing. I like that term too, winning warm up. That sounds cool. Well, what Matt winning come up with it, so. uh he named it after himself and it, oh, look at him. <laughs> it, I guess when you're a world record holder, you get to do that sort of thing, but, uh, it's a lot of rights to do what he wants to do. Uh, uh, don't he? <laughs> yeah, he does. Good yeah, he man. does. Good for that man. So, you know, you're talking about that glute mead. You got a band there. Mm -hmm. I, I see all you guys use trap bar. You can only get so wide, but a sumo, a sumo deadlift is one of the best hip builders you can do. How do you utilize your trap bar to kind of shore up some of them weak spots. So, um, I don't really use a trap bar to, to, um, to, to, uh, fix the glute meat or anything like that. 
We'll do more lateral lunges. We'll do a lot of, we do a lot of uh, trying to hit all three planes. Because remember, when I pick our exercises, we go off of movement patterns and uh, and different vectors. We don't necessarily go off of lifts to a muscle. Okay, so we're not saying only oh, it's an upper body, lady, or lower body, or or even full body. We got to make sure that at least once a week, and if it's a sport like hockey or um, that's going to have more uh, side to side, like uh, especially like I like uh, right before basketball season starts, because I know everybody wants to work on their defense. We'll do more frontal plane exercises for those athletes as well. And so we'll do we'll do lateral lunges. We'll go heavy lateral sways with a landmine. And that's really where we get that that tension on on that uh, that part of the body. Um, and then we'll also we'll also start to make it more dynamic. And so we'll do skater jumps, like lateral jumps back and forth. And then we'll add a med ball to it with a slam in it. And then the hardest one for them to do is actually hold a ten pound plate and act like you're going to slam it hard down, but you're not letting go of that ten pound plate because you're really putting a ton of eccentric force into that one single leg when you, and, and you, th- you would think, well, if I have a 25 pound plate, that's more way to be more, no, the, the velocity is going slower. So the power going down to that leg is, is less. So really like that 10 pound to five pound, if you're a lighter person is actually putting more force into the ground than you would, because you're the velocity is going fast enough than, than you could make with like a 25 pound plate. Yes. And then you have to stop that where 25, yeah. we, if you start getting too high, now you're leaking again. Yes, and, exactly. and you're and you're defeating the purpose of what you're trying to get the body to do, which is incorporate all that into itself and fulfill Newton's law. Yes, you know? yes, we want better breaks, right? Uh, because if we have, I mean, especially with the sports, that have so much change of direction, and we need to have really good breaks. So I've been bouncing this around, and I, I know you can use it for different things, but downhill work. I think mm-hmm. the quickest way to create breaks in a kid would be to sprint downhill Mm -hmm. you have braking the whole time you're getting up to top speed your body doesn't want to let you get there it only will overcome it for a few seconds which creates overspeed eccentrics and then it's right back to braking again yeah does that theory hold any water with you i don't know um so i've never i've never technically done it like i've done it with my own training a little bit when i was down in texas in the summers and we were running hills and so we'd run back down because I don't know. We were crazy kids. Um, but so I know the feeling of what it feels like. I don't know. I don't have any metrics on it or, uh, or any, uh, data on it, but I, I do subscribe to the theory of it. The incline I think needs to be, be at least, at least 11% or less. Like we don't need a large incline. I'd probably say five or five or six might even be too much. To be honest with you. It's almost like where you feel that hill when you're walking up, you can just feel that rise. That's the way I would say you want to run down. Um, and that's where I think that you re- where you get what you're talking about, um, uh, where it's not going to change your gait. Okay, so it can't anything to improve your sprinting can't change your gait when you're doing those max velocities. So you can't pull whether you pull or whether you or whether you drag, you can't be pulled uh, faster than like I mean, you, I guess you could, but like you don't want to go more than that like ten percent either way, right? Because you know, and so the grade might be less than that because of the velocity. So um i'm not doing a great job of explaining this but basically what i'm thinking is that in theory yes that's going to help you with your braking but it's also going to help with your maximal velocity especially if you come to a stop too so it could be a five a five yards like a doing some acceleration work downhill five yards come to a stop with the right leg in front okay split split stance then five yards left and then switching back and forth or it could be both and break plant or uh, sorry uh, uh jump cutting to the side and going that way and really working on uh That'd be a way of loading your uh, your uh, your uh, eccentric stops or your or your uh, change of direction. I think it takes a very negligible hill to yeah. create a result. I mean, I don't know that you need to go out to a pond dam and run no. down it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Someone's so, down a viaduct, or down a viaduct. <laughs> so, in my mind, we'll kind of go back to what we were talking about with force absorption. Through the box squat, like you were talking about earlier with bands, I believe that force absorption can be created and increased because you can see all the leaks when that kid, whether that kid plops, whether he absorbs it and then reverses it and brings it back up. We may differ on this. I don't know. Is it something that you've noticed ever before? Oh yeah. Especially, especially with. And I don't do a lot of box squats to be honest. Like like our our training pretty simple. So I know we're talking some pretty advanced stuff. Um, like, like kids on bands for me, they got to get, they got to earn that. Like, 
it's not something we just put on a sophomore. You know what I mean? Like, it, like we're talking about juniors and seniors with training ages of maybe 40, even five or six or seven years. Um, they, they squat typically 1.7 to 2.0 plus times their body weight. Um, they know what they're doing. Like, like, uh, their power development, if we're looking at power, peak Watts is probably above 1800 Watts to 2000 Watts, uh, before we really get into some crazy band work. But going back to what, what you're talking about with absorbing force and, and trying to, you see those energy leaks, especially on a box squat. And then you put add bands to it. It's just, you're adding more challenge to the nervous system, right? So the brain has to now have to find this box that it cannot see to sit down on. It has to, um, make sure that we're reaching back at the right technique. We got to make sure we get that, that triangle with the foot holding and balancing everything. Plus we have load on there. Plus we have bands now that are pulling down both, both ways. So if you're not, if you don't have a, if you don't have the core strength and you don't have the uh, vestibular awareness to keep those band tensions, even that's where you see those types of, uh, th those types of hazards happen. So you can definitely see those energy leaks because it's going to come out in an ankle or knee on one side or the other right away. Um, but what I really look at, um, is not only the, not only the energy leaks, but like, how are they overcoming it? Right. So how are they coming out of that hole when they touch the box? How are they, how are they exploding out of that? Because really I care as an from an athletic performance standpoint, I know they're never going to lower anything as, as, as slow as that. I care how fast they're ballistically coming up out of it concentrically. Right. And so the other thing I care about then is when we take those bands off, we take, we get the load off. How fast can they change direction from coming down into uh, a loading position to explode up again for a jump or for a sprint or for acceleration or whatever it is that they need to do for their sport? Now, leading down this road a little bit, you get the monster you feed. Mm -hmm. So if I've heard it said, you know, that if, if one rep max is your God, kids will sell out to get the one rep max. I also believe that works the other way. If speed is your God, kids will sell out to go faster and they will shed the forces that you're wanting them to absorb because they're looking at faster bar speeds. Mm -hmm. So then you get the loose kid on the bench doing a bench press and he never tightens his lats. Nothing ever gets absorbed into his body, but he's moving the bar fast. Yeah. How do you get that kid or that athlete to kind of start accepting them? forces does that come with a training age or does that come with getting that coached in there like hey you're moving the bar really fast but you're shedding every force that we want you to accept and return into the bar yeah yeah i hear what you're saying so when we when we go through this we have like i said we're doing a thread of everything but we're focusing on one thing at a time so typically if we're doing speed strength stuff and we're focusing on that that means they've already gone through our strength our strength phase of really getting those the of trying to mitigate those energy links with building strength first. And they've already grouped the movement patterns, which happened first too, before that. So um, our footings, our movement patterns, our foundation is our, is our strength. So then the power is then the next, the next part of our, our of our structure. Okay. And that, and, and that's putting the electricity in the house. Right. So, so if we don't have good uh, footings and we don't have good uh, uh, foundations, it's not going to, it's not going to help us. Okay. So, so typically I shouldn't see that if, if we're focusing on those things the right way. And if, the, unless say, for example, we have an athlete that, that is struggling with that, then we might need to regress and work on some more strength for a little while, whether it be for that lift or for that movement pattern or for that, um, that joint angle, right? Cause we know joint, we know power is joint angle specific. So there might be, we might've missed something like, for example, like you're saying with the squats and like, even though we do eccentric squats for for a block, they might maybe they maybe they're really bad coming out of the middle part of the hole, right? They got they get they can bounce. They they've been cheating it by bouncing out of the bottom. You know what I'm saying? So uh, squats, you can do the same thing with bench. They, let's say they let's say they bounce it off their chest. You know what I mean? Like, well, they suck at that bottom part. We never attack that. We need to really work on. That. I see that a lot with our female athletes. They they either don't want to go down all the way, and so then they get weak at the bottom portion of a bench. Or like with our male athletes, they want to bounce it off their chest, and and uh, and it, and I know we're talking powerless because that like that's that's the easy thing. I see it with cleans as well. You know what I mean? Like, um, they're doing a clean, and they and and like uh, a lot of my guys will they'll if they're not on the first pull, if they're not pulling the bar vertical in front of over the shins, and they're not moving their knees back, 
then what happens is they get bar displacement and then they have to chase the bar. And so if we see something like that, we got to make sure we fix it. Right. So um, that's why I always say technique overrides everything. So even though I love the velocity based training, it doesn't take away the coach's eye. Um, even though you can get bar displacement on some of these to get feedback for the student athlete, they still got to apply it. Like, so like I, I, I'm going on a tangent here a little bit, but like technology is a tool. It's not the answer. Okay. We, we have to make the decisions on the information we get. We're just getting more information than we've gotten in the past, right? Because we're using technology to get, to get information that we couldn't just see with the naked eye necessarily, or we're refining it. It's stuff we already knew, like any good thing, any good strength coach, any good, any coach in general, they know what, how fast a guy should move or how fast a lift should be or how slow it should be or how controlled it should be. And so now we're just putting a number to something that we've already known. Now, this is something we, we haven't discussed, but you brought up cleans. I, mm -hmm. I know you're an Olympic lifting guy. I don't have a whole lot of experience with it. I'm not a big Olympic lifting guy. But I do see what you're talking about in cleans. From the top of the deadlift to the bottom of the rack, it seems to me like you watch a lot of kids really coast into that bottom position. So by the time it's all said and done, from that position, they haven't really moved the bar that far. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They've, let, they've let every, it seems like a harder eccentric stop would create a better stopping athlete than letting them coast so far down with the bar. Obviously, my work with cleans is limited. Is that something you've ever noticed before? Oh, yeah. So there's unintended consequences with any lift that we do. There's, there's also intended consequences with any lift that we do. And so we're using all of our lifts, anything that we're doing in the weight room, anything we're doing from a training aspect, even if, even if you're a sport coach doing practices and you're breaking down something like, like 7v7 versus 11v11, okay? There's still going to be some sort of something that they're missing because we're focusing on one thing that if we don't address all of it, we're going to miss out on it, right? So like with a clean, like what you're talking about is, is we're going to really work on that eccentric action of like, or that, like the uh, eccentric, like of quickly, I always say it's such a great force development of quickly transitioning and catching it down to the bottom position. However, it's a it's a ballistic movement, so it's there is no really centric in that. So why that why do you see Olympic weightlifters uh, doing front squats a lot and back squats because they need to get that in there, or that's going to be that's going to be their weak their weakness or the weak point. So um, same thing for our athletes. If we just did cleans, that's not necessarily going to help. And for all sports, clean might not be the answer, or for that athlete, even if it is a sport that. Like football clean might not be for that that actual athlete necessarily too. So um I know you hear people always say, I'm not married to exercises, I'm married to whatever. Uh that's how I, I kind of think of the fact that like, okay, what what do we need to do within reason for each athlete that's gonna that's gonna help them? And so if we see that that, that lift isn't working for them, or we see that that then we're not seeing transfer, whether you're using a force plate or whether you're looking at the the game film or whatever, you gotta make those changes. Otherwise, we're gonna keep doing the same thing. So going full circle back with the cleans, like it depends too where you catch it at. So if you're always catching it, like I always teach them to catch it in the full range in the bottom position first, and then we'll start to raise it. And then same with when you start, we're going to start, we're going to start it from, the, we're going to start from the uh, hang and we're going to work our way down to the floor. Uh, actually, we start from the, from the thighs, like a, like an old school, like international or uh, a hip clean. And then we start to move it down and then and we, but we catch from the bottom first and we move up. So I kind of do a little bit of both. Um, when we're, when we're teaching those cleans, um, and, and, and how to do it. So I'll do the same thing. And this goes into another thing with our squats. When we start out in, in season, they're doing full range of motion squats. As we get closer and closer to the end of the season, they'll do, a, they'll do their first set or their warm up sets, um, as a full range motion. And then we'll start to bring the depth of our squats to a half squat and then a quarter squat, depending on the sport, because they might not need it or they might need it. So. And not only in sport, the position, like I still make our defensive tackles squat and deep and offensive uh, uh, guards squat deep because they're in that position more often and they have to be in that position. Whereas with uh, my wide receivers, by the end of the season, we're not, we'll do one set to maintain that strength and keep that range of motion, but we're not focusing on that anymore, right? Because like we just said, you're going to get what you put in and you're also not going to get what you don't put in. So we got to make sure that we're finding that 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 sweet spot or that balance the best that we can. Talking about the clean and the eccentric break and sometimes how long it takes that athlete to break the bar. I I think I've noticed that you see it in the box jump too. Mm -hmm. So you take a kid 
and he's starting to get up to some pretty good heights, he'll jump, he'll hit the box or she, and they, they won't catch themselves at the box. Their mm-hmm. feet will hit and they'll let their butt drop. Yep. And it can drop a great amount of length. Well, at that point, you're not absorbing force anymore. You might as well be done. Yeah, you might be able to jump higher on a box, but your body quit absorbing the force. So now you have to figure out a way to teach that to happen. Yeah. And, and like, so what's the purpose of the box anyway? Really, it's just to, uh, to deload the landing, right? So I don't care how high of a box they can jump on. No one, like we, we measure your vertical. We don't measure your box jump, right? So we'll use your vertical to dictate your box height. And so if you're, and I like kids landing in a, in a parallel or above position, but your hips should always land higher than your knees for the box to be the proper height. And then depending on what type of sport or what type of box jumps we're doing, okay, like volleyball, I might, I might want them to land even higher because that's t- similar to how they're going to jump and land for their sport. Um, and so it just depends on what, what is your goal with the box? Uh, cause there's a lot of different ways you can do it, but at the same point, like, like landing in a squatted position on a box, like, I know that's fun. I'll let the kids do it a little bit, but like, we're not training that way. That's not going to develop. I, I don't see the benefit of what we're developing with them landing in a squat position, jumping onto a box. Uh, we, we have other ways we can do that. Right. And I would agree and I would disagree. Yeah. So you're getting a hard eccentric stop at the top of a force mold movement. You're yeah. getting, you're getting a clean without the bar is what you're getting in my mind. Yeah. It's an so, unweighted. It's an unweighted. Uh, yes. So again, that's a different, different style of curve, like what you were calling ballistic versus uh, explosive. Right. And we could argue it both ways. It's just, it's nice to talk to somebody that kind of wants to talk it and, uh, yeah, yeah, and, love it. and see it both directions. So yeah. do I think it, it's creating this hugely explosive athlete? Probably not. But the other thing it kind of does is it forces a mobility. Mm-hmm. You know, you can static stretch and do all these things you want, but you start getting a box up there. The hips have to get moving. You have to free the hips up through the, through the movement. Now, you may have created a faster athlete because he's more mobile. So if you want to use it for a mobility exercise, I can see that totally, uh, especially for like a wrestler. You know what I mean? Um, we were talking about wrestling earlier. Uh, I could totally, cons- I could totally see it from that kind of perspective. Um, I also think though, too, that like I can, I can create similar actions doing, doing fast eccentrics with a, with a barbell too. Right. Like, so there's two different ways you could do it too. You know what I mean? Like an unloaded barbell. Right, but you've got to get those ath- athletes moving that bar to, mm-hmm. to to get close to those same numbers. Yeah, but when, what, again, but when again, when it comes to down, I care about them rapidly e- eccentric, uh, eccentrically going down, but then coming back up. That's what I really care about. So if I'm going to do like the exercise you're talking about of them landing in a, in a squatted position on a plyo, I would really, really care about them getting out of that right after they hit it. Okay, so we're talking about a little bit of two different things because mm-hmm. you're you're – and I agree with you 100%. I talk to the kids all the time about this. You're really into that reversal strength. I am. Yeah. So for something like that, you you almost need to add two bounds together and you would almost be better. Yeah, I love doing double bounds. I love yeah. doing I love doing double broad jumps um because I want to see I just forgot the word for it, the technical term, but like like what you're talking about for like uh for that is like I want to see that we can uh repeat rapid concentric movements over and over again, which, which I call explosive, right? We want, we want, uh, Jimmy Radcliffe would say he wants, uh, he wants super balls, right? We don't want bowling balls, right? So, or tomatoes, we want, we want something that can bounce and be able to recreate that over and over that spring action, being able to, um, uh, break and then concentrically explode again. Right. So anytime you can create that, like, uh, a speed bench. You know, I, I want to see them, them guys being as close to their chest as possible, but never hitting the chest, essentially breaking that as fast as possible. And then the bottom part of that curve coming out because you're doubling the forces on the bar. So yes, maybe there's only 95 pounds on the bar, but at that reversal point, you're at 190 pounds, maybe even a little bit more. And then the, then that's where you start getting into bands because the lift's going to coast at some point. So now you put the bands on take the coast out yes. and and then those forces on the reversal have to even be faster. So kinetic that's the nail on the head, right? Cause they got to right. reverse faster. Um, so they got to, so that's, that's rate of force development is really all that is. 
And so I stole a lot of this stuff from Baloo um, when he was at Indiana and IMG of we got to get these strong guys strong first, right? Because none of that none of that matters if they don't move well and they're not strong. And I know we keep going back to that. And then they have to they have to be able to create power. And so if you talk to certain sports scientists, they'll tell you power is a fluffy metric, right? Because because you have distance that's playing a part in it, you have the load and you have the speed that are all playing a part. So if we're dictating this distance, right, whether it be a half squat, a full squat, or or uh, a full bench, we're dictating the distance that the athlete is creating. If we dictate the speed, then the only thing that can change the power is the is the load. So then, like you said about the eccentric rate of force development, or sorry, the uh, concentric rate of force development, them have to reverse and come up fast, right? They that's where the bands can come into that play too. So we get them strong, we get them powerful. Then we gotta we gotta move that we gotta move that peak power so that the curve is closer to where their sporting event would be at. And what I mean by that is, if I'm an offense or defensive lineman. I have to create my peak power at 0.45 seconds because that's from the ball being snapped to when I when I make contact with another with an, with my opponent. Whereas if I'm a wide receiver or a defensive back, um, necessarily that's playing a little bit more press coverage or a linebacker, it's typically somewhere between 0.9 to 1.5 uh, um, uh, seconds. So I got to be able to hit my peak power at those times, and if I'm not, then I need to, That's where the bands come in. To work on getting that curve to go back uh closer to, or getting the curve to go the peak power to get closer to a faster uh time so we're now, talking about two times we're talking about velocity and we're talking about the time that you hit the peak velocity right and this is where i know we're not training bodybuilders but i think this is where bodybuilders have one up on us is because they never let the muscle off the hook the muscle's always under tension so when you get into something like that they have a mind muscle connection so they have more motor muscle recruitment for that so now that they're starting to generate more force because the muscle stays under tension where we get to expressing too much speed and we let that leak yeah i, I think it depends on if it's when, when contact happens i agree 100 percent. but when but i would say too we have to be able to get our the, the trick for most athletic events is we got to be able to relax and contract quickly and so we, so, so like by them going down, like if we're doing a, a Bulgarian squat with bands on it, we have to get down and hit the muscle to relax, to fire back up out of, out of that position, out of the eccentric position. So I see what you're saying with that. I would say whenever there's contact already happening, that's where a bodybuilder would have that time under tension of being able to keep that muscle activated and continue to go. I'd say with most things that we're doing, it's more about relax and then contract, right? It's about being able to do those things very quickly especially when you get into like sports like track and field where it's sprinting um because it's less over time if you look at other work like they'll say over time like the you get to a certain level of strength then the muscle coordination takes over more than the strength does for speed all right so just to disclose this yeah there's not very much we disagree on but I'm gonna throw I'm, disagree on. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm no, no. What I was gonna say is I'm gonna throw the craziest ideas out there at you. It doesn't right. mean it doesn't mean I believe them, but that's kind of what I've been doing this whole podcast. Yeah. So if somebody's out there listening and they're just like, "Where is he coming up with these crazy ideas?" It's just like <laughs> I'm gonna throw them at you just to see how you answer yeah. them because. You, I don't know. Maybe I'm all wrong. You know what I mean? Like I'm just going off the stuff that I've read and I've done and what I've seen. Uh, but it, I love what we're talking about, man. It's freaking awesome. Yeah, I just don't want it to feel like I'm challenging you. I just I'm enjoying the conversation, so I'll go down any yeah, rabbit any going, rabbit hole going. I can. Squatting for change of direction. Yep. Me and you talked about this, and I think a lot of times we let our squatters squat too narrow. Mm -hmm. And if you want to create a a guy that can really change direction, if you can open that squat stance up, get those hips a little bit better, get him in that real good seated position, you will create a better change of direction athlete how do yeah. you i know we've talked about this and i think you're on board but i'll let you explain why you think that is yeah that's something i want to play with more we, when we were talking it's like man i never really thought about i mean i've done it a little bit like change the change the pattern of the squat based on the width of the stance um that's something i want to do more with because i'm doing a lot of the tony lani um which he's a genius if you're not following the stuff that that guy's doing um that kind of stuff with the change direction, especially wide-based crossover, is a squat. 
Uh, I posted a bunch of stuff on social media about what that looks like. And I really think that like, I know when we talked about squat being related to, to speed, and I don't think there's much a correlation or if it is a correlation, it's, it's, it's convoluted, but I do think it really helps with change direction. There are studies out there that show that squatting helps with change direction because you are in a balanced stance. You do have to go side to side. There is a lateral component of a squat. Um, and so it really intrigues me about maybe changing the stance. I would be really focused with the foot and the toes and where those are pointing. Cause a lot of times when you see them go wider, the toes flare out and I wouldn't want them to be in that position when they're changing direction. And I'm also not wanting to probably go wider than just over the hips, but still be underneath the shoulders. I wouldn't necessarily want them going wider than the shoulders for that squat. Unless there's a, unless I'd have to look at the movement patterns of the sport of if they're ever out that far. Like uh, sometimes you might see with like a baseball player when they're playing the field, maybe um, I'm trying to think of like a sport hockey goalie, maybe like, I'd have to look at some of the different sports and what, what position they would be in to see where, where they would have to, again, contract fast, um, relax, contract fast in those positions. And that's where we could build off of that with those, with the squats or lateral lunges too, you know, like, like we're talking about the sways. Now you said something in there that me and you had talked about a little bit before too. So I don't disagree that you're not going to see the squat and sprinting. I, the strength will help up to a certain point and then you got to do what you got to do. But maybe we're looking at the squat wrong. Maybe, maybe the squat doesn't help sprinting, but what the squat does help is with force absorption. How else are you going to prepare an athlete to acquire, let's say in a 40, you have an elite athlete. He's taken a thousand pounds of force each stride on one foot. Now you can do bilateral, unilateral, whatever, however you want to negotiate that in, in your head. Yeah. But, but in a 40, he's taken on 13,000 pounds, mm -hmm. essentially. How else can you prepare the body to accumulate those forces unless you're squatting? Yeah, I think that, um, I think that squatting plays a part in it. I, cause I, I believe in squatting. Like I, I fully believe in it. I understand why some don't. I understand. And I've seen too, that like some kids are fast that never squatted before or athletes are fast that never squatted before. And some athletes are uh, fast that have squatted a ton before too. Um, and so I've seen it both ways. Um, I think more along the lines of it is all, I guess my question is all, is all force created equally. And what I mean by that is when you're sprinting at a velocity that fast, you know, when you're trying to go your full, your max speed, okay. The force on the leg and foot is so instantaneous. It's not the weight that you would see as if you were squatting necessarily with the force. And so here's my example of that is if you think about a truck and a truck tire, right? It's if it's going really fast down the road, is it getting those forces? But if I put a bunch of, uh, 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 bricks in the back end of that, uh, half ton pickup, it's a totally different force now, isn't it? Cause now the force is going into the tire as opposed to the tire traveling, traveling the force around it. And so I, this is just theory for me. I, I mean, like, that's how I kind of think of it is like, so do, do you have to have the, do you have to have the portion where you can handle force? Absolutely. Can squat help with that? I believe it can. Uh, if you look at Matt Ray's research on this, he says it's about 1.5 to 1.7 times your body weight on back squat where strength matters. And you'll still see your speed continue to go up when you get to that point of your squat. And then at that point, after that, that's when he talks about the muscular uh, coordination taking over and being more neural. And I, I really think that he's onto something there with that because um, I have seen guys that don't squat, squat and then get faster. And I think that's where that falls. And I've also seen guys that don't squat that are fast, but then if I squatted them, holy crap, they, they, they're they strong. They're already strong, you know, like, and so we got to talk about the different athlete too. Like if it's a track sprinter, okay. They probably don't need it. They, they probably don't need as much of it as what the, we talked about earlier with the football player, with the body armor and that type of stuff too. And we're talking about like one bout of a hundred or 200 or, or okay, three with full, full rest. Whereas like a football player is going to do 60 plays minimum, right? Like, um, same with like lacrosse or even soccer because soccer, like, uh, they're they're going continuous even though it's a stop a stop start they're just not getting the full rest that you would in a track meet and i'm i'm with you on the theory you're you're going down there i'm just trying to figure out in my head we have to build force absorption in the body and strength in the body otherwise drugs and i would... agree with you yeah like so can that because you can do the same thing with the forces of doing trap bar jumps in in a, in a certain way um 
so I'm with you in this in the in clear up to if this was the case, drugs wouldn't work. Right, right, right. Uh, you know, and so yeah. we're we're obviously seeing and now I understand there's a recovery component, but that allows you to train more, which allows you to take on more volume, more mm -hmm. accumulation. So somewhere along the lines, there has to be a point where they tie together, whether we can see it or not. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. Like I, I, I believe in squatting my athletes, you know what I mean? Um, and, and, and I don't like, we, we can go down the debates of bilateral versus unilateral and all that kind of stuff. But, but regardless of that, like, uh, I do think that it can help and be beneficial. I also understand when some, uh, uh, strength coaches or speed development coaches don't believe in it. If you think about how they're looking at it and how we're looking at it, we're looking at it from a muscular standpoint and contractions with the muscles. And that does play a part. Some of them look at it as these muscles are hanging by tendons and joints and they're having neurons fired through there where the muscles are just doing the muscles are the muscles don't have brains. They're just doing what the neurons tell them to do to fire and then it hangs there the rest of the time. So you have to be able to go relax and contract faster. So I understand both sides of it. I do think that there's a, there's a, like you said, there's a, there's a converging point where those two match, uh, to, to, to make what we're talking about work. Um, but at the same point, like I, like I see that it's hard to explain that, that they have, um, that that squats, can, I would say that squats can definitely be beneficial, but it can also be harmful at some point too, right? Because if we are, not, if we aren't moving it, if we can't move the leg, the limp at the velocity that needs to be moved because there's too much muscular on the bone, on the bone, or the muscle can't fire fast enough, that'd be where, where it becomes detrimental. And so then you have two other, then the other thing you have going on with the way that the squat works versus a cylindrical action of the leg is with a squat, you're going up and down. Whereas with the leg, you're, you're, cracking that heel up to the, to the glute and then whipping the leg forward and whipping it back down or slicing it down. So you have two things going on. And so I think that squats help with it. Like, again, it's a part of it. It's not the whole. Right. And I wouldn't argue that at all. What I'm looking at is you start getting into some of Bill Parisi stuff mm -hmm. Cal, and Cal Dietz and Chris Corfus and stuff with fascia tendons. Mm -hmm. How do you strengthen them? Is running is sprinting enough or where do you find the next level of bringing them tendons up to where your muscles are? Yeah. So that goes into, that goes into what I like to do versus what others like to do. So isometrics are known to help with tendons. Now, the thing with isometrics that is you have is when you're doing isometric, you're only strengthening that, that end of the, of the angle, right. And that joint of the angle, right. So, so you would have to do like, when you look at the terrace isometrics, you got to do, if I remember them right, the uh one 135 150 and 165 degree of that knee joint just to strengthen the tendons for that knee joint still doesn't take very long but you still got to make sure that you're hitting all those different joints you can also do it if you go by keith barr's research which i like doing this is having them left heavy at least one day and we can see if it if it if you're able to at 0.3 to 0.5 meters per second you need to be in that maximal that uh circa max strength level and that will also strengthen the tendon. It's that's why I like them doing one set or two sets of full range of motion. So we are strengthening the tendon uh, throughout the entire range of motion. And and I'm not saying that wh why do one or the other? Mix them up a little bit. Do do isos after you do the full range, then do an iso, and then go back into the um, to, to your sets or or do the isos at the end like I do like I do with my athletes. Um, I think sometimes we like get married to a certain style of training and, uh, or a certain like, uh, um, periodization or set rep scheme. And it's like, man, like there's so many different ways we can do it and, uh, find it, finding the one that works the best for the athletes that you have is probably the better answer and not going by what you like to do or what you know how to do. Yeah. And what you're talking about there, some of that kind of bumps up on Yessie stuff too. I just got his explosive running book and i've been working through it so he's kind of of the camp that if you're not training directly in the pattern that takes on sprinting you're not training sprinting why the, why the, everything else is just gpp you know uh yeah. it has to be a direct correlation to see a benefit now the other the other stuff helps i mean i don't think he's saying it doesn't help but when you really really get sport specific he's talking about 
joint angles and where you're going to be when you're sprinting. Yeah, I agree with you. I think you need to have a, a I, well, I do agree, but I also agree. I think you and I find, fall on the same line of the fence here. You need to have GPP because otherwise you're going to see more injuries. And I've seen that with athletes. When we get too specific, that's when you see the injury. So like, like uh, I was talking to Rob Assis, uh the other day about how I said, hey, even our track athletes, when we do our, when we finish up our dynamic warmups, we're finishing where they work on stopping. Okay. They need, even though they don't necessarily decel in their actual sport, they still got to, we still want to train those qualities because that's building the ten- tendons again when we're, we're, when we're doing decels. And so they're doing a 20 yard sprint into a decel. They're not going to blow a knee out doing a 20 yard uh, acceleration into a decel. I'm not asking them to stop on a dime. Um, I'm not giving them a one yard to stop. You know, they got to, they, they get to govern when they want to stop on it. And so, um, I've never seen an injury with that. And so like what you're saying with that is like figuring out, um, the specific, the specific, the, the things that they need to be better specifically, but at the same point, not losing the qualities they need to be a general athlete and to keep themselves injury resilient, right? Like, uh, because you'll see it all the time with, like we talk about repetitive athletes, like a cross country runner or a swimmer. And then all of a sudden they hit a rock or their foot falls different onto the ground because it's not even ground in cross country or like your stroke becomes different. And then all of a sudden the hand is outside the the shoulder the way that it wasn't supposed to be and they get an injury and then they got this lagging injury all the time because they never trained parts of the other vector i'm not saying they got to focus on that but at some point we need to make sure that the body can handle the whatever whatever forces we put it through um intentionally or by by um some sort of circumstance that might be out of our control because we know that sports are chaotic right and so much of this training is the sports responsibility we, you can't take on every responsibility that the sport is supposed to provide to the training of the athlete and make it yes. a weight room yes. movement. Yes. And so like this is where I think it's, it's a little fun. And also at the same time, you got to be smart with what you're doing. Like we were talking about, okay, so if I'm working on change direction and, and cutting, okay. And then eventually agility. So in the weight room, I might have them doing some squats, may have them do some different skater jumps, things like that. We're working on changing direction back and forth. Um, things in a controlled setting, like a squat or, or, a or, a, um, a dumbbell lateral lunge or a step up. Okay. Then I'm going to take it to my field practice part of it, my field, uh, 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 performance work where now we're going to work on sitting in the, sitting in the squat. Okay. We might do start with some sways. We might start doing some change of direction. Okay. And then we start putting a stimulus to it where they're reacting off another person or another ball so that that's the way they'd start to build the agility part of it. Okay. So at what point does that become? sport versus my 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 realm and so i like to really try to do everything that i know that i can do to help them with their sport and then and then at the same point like my goal is to make it the best athlete i can for that coach so they have whatever moldable um uh person for that for that that they that we that we help that person become so that they can be better for their sport so that coach can take them to the next level you know so um and and vice versa right like hopefully the coach is wanting that. So if I'm not giving the coach, like, like obviously the, the athlete has their abilities and we want to try to accentuate those abilities. We also got to attack the things they suck at. And so otherwise it's going to come out one way or another. And so I'd rather them work on not only be like, I, I always say, Hey, we're, I'm at a fast school. We're going to double down on speed. Okay. We're also going to work on the things that we're not good at too. We need to work on strength because we know we got to get stronger. We also know that we have to make, make sure that with speed comes a, a big responsibility of injuries. We got to make sure that we're trying to keep those those uh prevent those injuries from happening or at least mitigate those injuries from happening. And so um uh, with that, I gotta really focus in on 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 trying to make sure that I'm riding that line of the two that what we're doing is transferring to the sport that they're gonna play. But at the same time, I'm not teaching them how to play the sport. I'm trying to give them more tools to figure out and decide how they want to solve the problems in their sport. Yeah, and that creates a programming nightmare at times you can get so lost in the programming that you forget mm-hmm. what you're even even doing so how how are you able to kind of keep track of it all i've been there myself like yeah you know yeah. you can you can get lost in this stuff so yeah. finding your way when it gets a little hazy how do you do that yeah so stepping back out of the weeds that we were in okay so how we kind of do it is um so let's talk about like junior seniors uh like so i have them, i have them four days a week in class all right, so our our Monday, we're going to work on linear speed. Even if they're a volleyball player, we're going to work on speed. And when I say linear speed, we're working on max velocity, and we're also going to work on some acceleration. Okay, so we're going to get at least 
We're going to get at least four accelerative sprints in, so two with the warm-up, and then we're going to get 2D cells for sure with that, sometimes four. And then we're going to run at least two fly tens. At max, we'll run four with the time frame that we have, because I want them to have four to five minutes rest in between each one. When I say max velocity on the fly tens, they're going to run a, basically a 40. If they want to back up further than they can, my defensive tackles and offensive linemen and uh, throwers typically like to go from the 30, because they know that they hit their max speed about 30 yards out. Or sorry, 20 yards out into the so a 30 full, right? Um, when you count the fly 10 part. And then we're going to finish up with any extra time running two to three more accelerative starts. So we'll run a five into a 10 yard sprint. So it's 15 yards. Then on Tuesday, that's going to be our max, our max effort lifts. That's when we're going our uh, uh 0.30 to 0.50, 80 to 90 uh, percent of our max. Um, if they're in season, they're going 0.5. If they're out of season, they're going 0.3. And then as the season goes, we're going to start to change the depth of the squats or the depth of what we're doing based on what they need. And in our in, in our sets, I like to do, I like to have them in groups of three. And I like to have, if one's uh, working one spot and then the other one's doing some sort of plyometric or they're doing something that might be something kind of specific for them. So that's where I can sneak the med ball throws in for my baseball rotational athletes. That's where I'll sneak leg swings or the, or the uh, isometrics in for like my uh, sprinters and uh, fast athletes and things that need that. Uh, that's where we can kind of parcel off some of those things. So like when we're doing our plyometrics inside of there too, because I like the PAP work, I like the post-activation potentiation action of those things. That's where they might, like if they're a vertical-based sport, we're going to do more vertical-based jumps for a basketball player or a volleyball player. Whereas with like my football players or my wrestlers, we're going to do more horizontal jumps because that's going to probably transfer more to the sport that they're playing. So then then the second, that's the first two days. And the, then the third day is going to be our speed strength if they're in season. And uh, if they're out of season and they're in the power development phase, that'll still stay be speed strength for them. They're hitting 1.0 on those lifts. And then if they're a, uh, a strength athlete, meaning that they need to work on strength, then they're going to be still doing 0.3 to 0.5. And they're going to they're going to get the speed strength stuff when we do our plyos. They're also going to get more starting strength, and they'll get more of the speed strength stuff when we're doing our cleans. So they're going to get it. It's just a threat of it as opposed to the whole thing for that day. And then on uh, our last day, that Friday, oh, we because we're a modified block schedule. That's where we'll put some change of direction, some extra like jumps or recovery. That's where I sneak in all that extra stuff is after that 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 speed strength lift, or if they need a second day of strength. And then that last day, that Friday, if they're in season and they don't have a game, then they're going to work on strength speed, or if they're in, or if they're in the power group, they're going to work on strength speed. And if they're in uh, if they're in season, they have a game, they'll do starting strength and do a game day workout really fast, really explosive. And then if they're out of season on that Friday, they're going to work on strength again, right? Because we need to build that, that foundation of strength. So we're going to just keep, keep, so people talk about filling buckets. I think more about kindling fire. We're going to keep feeding that fire with the wood that it needs because we don't know how big they can make that flame as opposed to just pouring into them. So that's how I kind of do that. And then if they're, like I said, a junior senior and they're out of season, they come again after school. This is optional, depending on the like uh, uh, some sports are better than others at it and uh, about coming in after school. But then we have them come in three days a week after school. And that's where we can hit all the extra stuff that we might not have got during the day or some of those other special lifts that I would like to get them to do uh, and keep it fun. Because I, like I am big about I know I know the consequence of what we're doing by training and possibly two days, two days, uh, two times a day. Um, but I also know that we're not overtraining them because the time frame that I have is not, they're not doing more than two, they're doing less than two hours a day when I add up this, the after school with the, uh, um, uh, PE time, it's, they're not overdoing it. So what, I don't really have to worry about the overtraining. I just have to worry more about like making sure that they stay interested, they stay consistent and they want to be there because I want it to be an experience where when they do get done with playing high school sports and or college sports or pro sports. They want to continue to to lift. They want to continue to play play whatever recreational games and sports they want to do, and just train and and have fun. You know, be good dads and mothers to their kids and play with them, uh, and continue to build on this great great sports that we have here in America. Now you touched on it there overtraining. We talk about overtraining a lot, but if if the kid's not getting beat up at, at sports practice and running miles and miles and miles and added conditioning, it takes an incredible amount of work to actually over condition a kid. Yeah. It's, 
I look at it two ways. Yeah. So over condition and then, uh, and then you get the CNS, right? So we got two things going on. Um, and my old, and my old, uh, school, we used to, we had catapult. And so we would use GPS. And so I could see if we were over training in practice or not, uh, based on what they're doing along with what we were doing with, uh, in the weight room. And so there would be times where I would back kids off and the same thing I'll do here. I'll back them off based on what their practice were like. Cause I, we have surveys and I'll ask the kids as well. Um, and I'll ask and the coach will tell me too, like, Oh, we're pretty banged up. Okay. We can throw in a recovery day. You know what I mean? But like when it comes to like, like you're talking about like actually overtraining, I have found looking at GPS data that typically we undertrain more than we overtrain. Now I say that with a caveat because like you'll talk to old schools, like old school coaches probably still do overtrain. You know what I mean? Um, and when I say old school, I'm talking about like, Oh, we need more conditioning. We need to do gasters at the end of every practice. Like the schools that I've been at, we don't do that. You know what I mean? So, so the, the, the thing that I found is typically when our coaches under train is when they get to the end of the season, like the playoffs or regionals and, and, uh, sectionals districts time, because they're like, oh man, everybody's healthy. We don't get to be hurt. And so then they under train. And so they do less than what they've been doing before. And they were doing the right amount before. And so then that's what happens. And what else we've learned too, is as you get better at the sport that you play or whatever you do it actually gets easier. The load goes down, right? Like, and so we have to make sure that we're continuing to stimulate uh, not only the muscular system by doing things harder, but like also the novelty and the, uh, and the brain to make sure that, that they're, that they're getting the stimulus where they got to think and make decisions fast and uh, with, with their sport as well. So if we're, if we're not making them, we're not putting them in positions to have to react, then they're never going to, then they are going to under train. They have to be able to uh, think under pressure, like we were just talking about, like at the beginning of this thing. Yeah, they accommodate to sport practice like they do the weight room or anything else. If you're not changing the stimulus somehow, you're going to have an accommodated athlete, which may be great for what you want. But yeah, but in practice too, right? Like if you're doing the same everyday drills from week one to week 11, that, and you're wondering why they're not performing any better, like you should have things that you can scaffold and build off of those everyday drills. Um, I mean, like I, like I coached D line before, so, Hey, we're, we're going to start off by hitting the bags and the sleds with on our knees. And then we're going to start going, um, I have a three point, and then we're going to move with our slants and then we're going to start working on ripping off and making it and then ripping off and making a tackle, then scooping and scoring on a fumble and then throwing and interchanging those and mixing them up. Right. So this way that stimulus continues to change. So it doesn't become the same thing. Repetitive. It's still repetitive without repetition, man. You just opened a whole can of worms there. <laughs> you know, if, if people had never thought about it that way that is just an incredible way to think about it because until you'd kind of brought it up i never thought about a kid accommodating to practice and having to change the stimulus and starting to look at how you are building your pyramid so that at game 11 you're still growing as mm -hmm. opposed to your growth stopped at week three because all your players are just so used to what you're doing that nothing happens after that and then the and then and then the strength coach gets blamed because uh, the players don't look any better. <laughs> yeah, and I, that that could very well happen, right? Like, uh, like, well, they're not doing the same thing. And like, and you're like, well, that's weird because they're they're number they're stronger than they were at the beginning of the season, or their or their power develop or their power outputs uh, higher than it was at the beginning of the season. So you could see that as well. So you so they have to be challenged, and and like we always think about, like you said, we always think about like the physical aspects of it. Well, if you talk to like. Uh, if you ever read Fergus Conley's uh, Game Changer book, they're the four co-actives, right? So you have the psychological component. How are we? How are we challenging and uh, challenging them psychologically throughout a season and, and an off season? How are we doing it tactically, meaning the scheme, okay? And then how are we doing it technically, meaning their skill level, okay? So we need to build their skill levels throughout the season. Um, and typically, it, it doesn't mean that we need to be, build more skills. Maybe we need to refine the skills that they're doing, right? So, like I said attack the thing, attack the things that they suck at. But then at the same point, we need to make sure that we're continuing to develop the things they're good at and double it down on that. Okay. So like if I, if I'm a, if I have a basketball player, who's a good three point shot. We're going to, we're going to keep continuing to have him take three point shots, but maybe he has to work with a hand in his face. Maybe he has to work by uh, doing it, uh, shooting the shot off the dribble instead of always catching release. Yeah. And that's simple things that could go a long way. You just bought yourself another three weeks of stimulus or however long it takes for the body to accommodate. I know like in an exercise, that's why guys rotate in three weeks. Maybe yep. it's the same thing in practice, but now you're going to have to start tracking that to know when your numbers actually start declining. I think too often we use the eye test and that mm -hmm. isn't always the test that tells us what's going on. Well, they got, they got an advantage over us. They get the games, right? So like you can see like, 
okay, we've been working on, let's go to the shot. We've been working on dribble, but about, we've been working on shooting off the dribble and he's two for eight on it. So maybe we need to work on looking at, okay, how do we need to work on him working on his shot off the dribble? Is it because he's going left? Is he's going from, is he going right? Is it because the ball's coming off the left hand before he draws up for a shot or off the right hand when he draws up for the shot going left or right? Cause now we got four different scenarios that we can look at and see which one we need to attack. Cause maybe he, maybe his two shots were always when he dribbles off the right, going right. And he's good there. We need to work more on the left um, as an example of that. So if we can start to identify like, okay, well, what's the weak point with them and what's the good point. So we could tell him too, like, Hey, look, we're going to design plays tactically for him where he's going right because we know that he's going to make that shot a lot more doing it that way. And the same thing with the same thing with football air raid has done a great job with that of like having guys run routes <laughs> that are very similar in a certain position so that they get used to catching the ball in the same position. And that's why you see him catch so many balls. That makes a lot of sense. I know I hadn't really put it together until you start talking about it, but I see why it's so effective now. So let's say you have a volleyball girl working on her serve. First, first few weeks, just straight serve, get it going. And then I would go to a, a resisted serve. So put a band around their waist let them come into that for a while. Then after a few times of that, well, now you can start pulling them through so you can speed it up. So take the band, jerk them through the serve. Well, now you gained a couple of weeks there. Well, now you can start putting all this stuff together and you gained, you know, I don't know, 12, 14 weeks of advancement where if you just were stopped with the straight serve, you would have accommodated and the growth may not be there. And that's from a strength perspective, right? So, you have that strength perspective doing that. And, and typically I, th- I want to say it's like, I want to say 10%. Um, is, you don't want to go over that because then that can mess with their technique. Um, so, so you're, so you, let's say you're doing what you're talking about, right? A little bit of light resistance. They're working on their serve. Now we're seeing harder serves. You can also worry about their tactical play with that and where they're placing the ball. Okay. Cause each serve, every time they serve, it's a different serve because how we think it's the same motion. It's not the same motion because if they have to put the ball in the back right corner versus the back left corner, okay, they're gonna they're gonna adjust their shoulder, their their wrist, their their elbow, and how they come through, their follow through, how early they hit it, and so you have all those things that you can work on it with as well. So you just talked about having it making it a six week thing. You could make that a fifteen week thing, depending on where you want them to place it, you know. Uh, and then they have to learn to adjust based on when they throw the ball up, and because uh, sometimes they don't they they're trying to hit the same spot, but you're never gonna hit the exact same spot. So they got to make sure that they make those adjustments um, mid air as they're doing it as well. Which that's that's where you see the best athletes learn how to do things well when they're when they're not used to doing it the same way all the time. And so there's a really cool study. I think it was um oh he's out of Arizona State, uh Rob Gray, where they did this thing with baseball players where they told them, hey, instead of just trying to hit, they had three groups. One was a control group, so just hit the ball. The second group was keep the ball in play. The third group, they told them, hey, I want you to hit. They would actually tell them that they wanted to hit foul balls left and right, and they would practice that. Well, the group that hit the best in play was actually the group that practiced actually hitting balls out out of play as well because they now know where the bat, where they don't want to swing the bat at uh, so that they have a negative consequence, whereas those that are only focusing on the good don't know what's bad then. And then you take that to the next level. You're down 3-2 in the yes. count. And you're fouling off trash to not leave it in the umpire's hands because you know you can because yes. you've practiced that extra stimulus. Absolutely. So, yeah, now they're like, hey, I can fight this off. I'm going to wear this pitcher down. I'm going to get my pitch um, because they're getting those opportunities. So th- and that's and that's where the deci- that's where the, the, the athlete gets to make those decisions. Isn't that really cool? That that's where they get – now Now we develop them physically. We've developed them tactically. And then mentally they get the ta- they get the challenge of – of actually, that's where like we're, we're, when those athletes come back and they're so jacked up, right? When they hit a home run, and they know that you helped them with that, um, or at least we provided the platform for them to do that, um, or they had that that uh, no hitter, or let's say even a perfect game, which would be unbelievable. But like they know that everything was clicking, not just the physical part, not just the mental part, but it's all coming together. So like what you're talking about with the volleyball hit, going back to that, like now we're mixing worlds and that's where that specificity can come into play. But we have to be really careful. Is, is it transferring or is it, it has to help the athlete. And, and, that's, and that's, we get confused a lot of times because we see the action looking the same, 
but is just because the action looks the same doesn't mean that it's specificity. Right. No, and I agree with that 100%. So when I'm starting to talk about bands yeah, no, and, and, and the yeah. volleyball, I'm talking about waste. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I'm I not. Yes. I, okay. I was going to say, I'm not hooking them to arms. I'm yeah. not oh, doing no, no, anything no, no, like no. that. I know what Just, you meant. Yeah. I meant it to, I, and that's what I'm saying, though. Like, I agree with what you're saying, but 100%. But we see other, other people will start to say, oh, well, I can do this now. Like, all those weird gadgets you see on all the golfers, right? Like, you're like, what the hell are they doing? You know, like, right. And it's I, not what we're talking about. And I kind of knew where you were going with that. So, uh, I just wanted to make it clear before we got too down far down that road, but, <laughs> but yeah, you let somebody watch something long enough and they'll make a gadget for everything. And mm -hmm. so, sometimes a gadget's not what need, not as, yeah, I can't even talk now. It's not needed. It's right. just, you know, but it's just goofy. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's the same we, thing in the weight room. Like some of the stuff that some of the, you, we see people do in the weight room, right? We're like, what the hell is that helping? You know what I mean? Like, and it's, I think it goes beyond, can, can you just justify it? You know what I mean? There should be some sort of practice behind it where you, not only can you justify it, but you can also like provide evidence. Um, and I'm not saying everything has to be evidence-based, but you should be able to support the claim that you're making with what you're doing. Like what we were just talking about with building the hips. There's a lot of different ways we could build it. And I could totally see doing sumo squats to build it. Can completely see it that way. I have no problem doing it that way. I I, I like doing sumo squats. I like having our athletes do sumo squats. They get addicted to it, and then they don't want to do trap bar squats again. <laughs> Where I see a huge benefit in a straight bar squat over a trap bar squat is the ability to bring them hips in so fast. So if you're going from acceleration to top speed, them hips come from being back to being directly underneath you the quicker you can get those hips underneath you. And, and even on the football field, the quicker you can get from your hips back to your hips underneath you is going to create a harder stop. Yeah. Here's something cool. I know it's a little bit goes off the line what you just said. Something cool that we're doing this year that I've never, I don't know why I never thought about it before. We've always trapped our deadlifted. We never scrape our deadlifted. And so, so, okay. So let me ask you this. So I'm, we're going to go down this really cool story. Okay. So when you teach powerlifting moves, right? What's one of the first lifts you teach between bench squat and deadlift? The first lift I teach, yeah. Uh it it depends where we fall and where the kid comes out. Honestly, I could teach either one of them first. Yeah, but uh, you know, they the lift they struggle with the most, I would say, is the deadlift, mm -hmm. and because they think it's different than what it actually is. Yeah, yeah, and so like typically, like before there were racks, right? You have to pick up something off the ground. So typically the deadlift would be probably the first lift that you would teach and that you learn as a, as a child, even, right? Like, like even if you weren't living on a farm, you're picking up five gallon barrels of feed, right? Um, so let's assume that the deadlift is the first thing that you, that you teach them. You go into the Olympic lifting world, if you go into weightlifting, that's the last part you teach them is the pull from the floor. And so I've never understood that because you have one world that teaches, teaches that first and the other one does a top down approach. So they'll teach you the, they'll teach you how to squat first and, and catch and all that kind of stuff. Right. So, so my idea was like, okay, why don't we bring them both together? Right. And then we can get there faster. So one, one of the things that we're doing with our freshmen, and our sophomores this year is we're actually doing straight clean grip, straight bar deadlift for um, one of our, uh, for one of our knee joint exercises. And then we're also teaching them uh, once we get past like the body weight and goblet squats. And, and then we go into front front squats. And so we're actually teaching the front squat and we're teaching the uh, straight bar clean grip deadlift. And our parameters are for a male, for example, I want to see you, we're going to keep it simple because we use it by, by percentages of body weight, but Hey, I want to see you build a tra uh, straight bar deadlift, 250 pounds, which is not crazy. Okay. And I want to see you build a front squat 1.5 times your body weight. Okay. So we know that any athlete that can clean 1.3 times your body weight up to 1.5, that's a pretty, that's an animal right there. Okay. So if they can essentially uh, deadlift 250 plus and they can clean essentially 230 plus, I'm sorry, front squat 230 plus, all we got to do is teach them to put it together. You know what I mean? So we're doing complexes and teach them how to clean with lighter weights as we're building that musculature um, by having them do front squats and uh, clean grip deadlift. And so it's going to be really interesting to see what happens here over the course of the next couple of years because I already got freshmen right now that are squatting 1.7 times their body weight and back squat already, which is like, I've, I've never had that before. And I don't know if, I don't know 
I can't say that it's because we're doing this, but I do think that's a part of it. So let me throw this at you because I, I talk yeah. to coaches all the time when we start talking about deadlift and trap bar deadlift. Well, we do the trap bar deadlift because it's safer. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you clean? Well, yeah, we clean. That's the most explosive movement you can do. <laughs> Where, uh, What doesn't correlate in somebody's mind that you're deadlifting you know, a third of the movement, so why don't you teach it on a straight bar because that's what you're going to do when you clean. Uh, that's what I ask myself. <laughs> I, I don't know. Is that is that a crazy way of thinking about it? I mean, no, you're hitting the, I, I asked myself the same thing this last year. I was like, why? I've always trap bar deadlift there, guys, right? We had trap bars. We always did it. And so I'm like, why? Why do we, just like you said, why do we teach them to lift from the full from the floor, but yet we don't let them ever deadlift? And so, so I got to a point where I'm like, okay, we're going to try this this year and we're going to teach them to, we're going to say, look, once you get to 250, then we'll let you trap our deadlift. Even though we know trap our deadlift is more, is a, I wouldn't say a more safe position, but it's a, it's a, it's an easier position to teach because the hands are to the side. Right. Um, I also think that it is a more athletic position for sport. I'm not saying it's a more athletic position, but for sport. And I do think that they can pull more forces using a trap bar versus a straight bar. So when it comes to, um developing stronger athletes and using it as a means totally see that but if we're going to say that the clean matters then we better teach them how to straight bar deadlift so they can pull a weight that because because if they're not pulling at least 1 1.0 time, times their body weight the clean's not transferring anyway so we got to get them to that point before we can even worry about the like so you need to tell you oh we clean well yeah well you got to clean a certain you got to clean at least 1.0 times your body weight for that power to transfer to your sport so otherwise and, you're just wasting your time do another thing you know and and if you don't clean you want to use trap bar jumps or you want to use trap bar deadlift and then do trap bar jumps or whatever you can still get the same thing it's just the action is the same right the joint angles are the same it's just a matter of what you choose as your tools to get them there and you're kind of hitting on what louis simmons talked about a little bit in most cases the clean is too slow because the weight's too light it doesn't correlate so you're not getting a change in your athlete well, yeah, no, no wonder because he can't straight bar deadlift anything, and he because they never get to. So all of them forces drop. Where if you build that deadlift, well, now you're starting to build something that you can put together. Like you said, you're you're one of the first guys I've talked to that actually was kind of going down the same line of thinking yeah. I was on that. And I would I would argue too that the the first pull of a clean is not a deadlift like 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 a deadlift is because when you pull a deadlift, you're trying to pull fast from the floor. When you're pulling a clean, you're not trying to pull fast from the floor on the first pull. You're trying to pull controlled because you know you're storing that energy to go fast when you get above the knee. So, which is which is where your where where your hips come in. Yes. And there you're starting to get into the technique of what you really want out of the deadlift. Mm -hmm. And I know I've talked about it with other coaches, but when I teach it, I teach it to start with from sitting on a box. Mm -hmm. And the whole movement is predicated on as soon as your hips can take it, they need to take it. Yeah. So when you're a couple inches below your knees, them hips should be firing in as fast as they possibly can so that you are eventually setting the stage for when you go into the high school and he wants you to clean. You should be able to clean more than the other athletes because you understand where the load's going. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, I'm forgetting his name right now. Uh, shoot. Down in South Carolina. Um, that's doing the lip of, I'll think of his name in a second, but doing great work with using accommodating resistance for building up better Olympic weightlifters. Um, he's with Jim Moore. I'll think of his name in a second. Great guy. Does, does a phenomenal job. Um, he's at Lenore line and, uh, oh, crap. I'll think of his name, but awesome too. Um, I, I feel bad. I can't remember his name right now, but we would, but like, anyway, he's, he's doing a lot of stuff where he's taking, um, where he's taking, uh, elements from powerlifting and conjugate method to Olympic weightlifting and it's starting to build some really crazy Olympic weightlifters. Now I've had you on here quite a while and I know you're probably ready to go do something else, but sit here and talk. So I'll wrap up with this question this because my you, world, man, I love it. <laughs> we can talk about it as long as you want. I just, I never want to hold a, somebody over longer than what they want to be on here, yeah. but uh, I'd rather leave yeah, and leave set up there. and set up another podcast down the road than hash it all out in one night. But so to kind of head towards the end of the podcast here, you're one of the first people to ever go down the road of horses with me the other night when okay. we were talking about it, you know, <laughs> so we we're comparing stuff. So 
if you had to choose a horse to compare to an athlete, what would you choose? Yeah, we were talking about this a little bit, and I know nothing about horses. So you like you're. I'm gonna default. I'm gonna tell you my answer, and then I'm gonna default to you because um, I've never even ridden a horse before. Um, I remember my bu- one of my buddies having a bunch of show horses, and those things were so freaking mean. We had to clean out their stalls all the time, and they would freaking bite at us and everything else. But anyway, I think. Uh, so you, your question was, what would be the say, say it one more time the best. If you, if you was to compare your athlete to a horse, horse, what what would you want that horse to look like? Yeah. So I would say like, we're talking about this a little bit. Like when I think about like my running backs or like my athletic football players, I will want those guys to be barrel racing horses. They got to be able to change direction. They have to be able to move on a dime, but they still got to be strong to carry a person. Um, and I don't think, I, and I think like, I'm thinking like running backs, linebackers, those inside guys, whereas like the equestrian horses that are doing all the jumps and the fancy stuff, that's more my wide receiver. And I don't know this to horse breed names, but um, that's what I'm thinking about. Now, when I they talk about, when everybody talks about thoroughbreds, I'm thinking racehorses, that's your track. That's your track athlete. That's the guy that um, that's very specialized in doing one thing, skinny legs, narrow body, right? Like it's not built like those other horses we're talking about. Um and maybe the equestrian is also more of a safety where I'm sorry, the barrel racer is more of a safety. Whereas like the bucking horse would be more your linebacker fullback, like uh, the horse that nobody wants to get on at all ever. Right. And then you got your lineman being like uh, Clydesdales in the, in the heavy plow horse. Now we say that and I want fast, I want fast linemen. They have to be able to run. And so we're comparing an athlete to an animal um, as kind of like a metaphor. Uh, but yeah, give me, give me a bunch of Pegasus that have wings. I'll take those. <laughs> <laughs> you never have to worry where their feet are no no but how do i do on that because you, i don't know much about horse i do want to go see some horse trainers at some point because i do think that they have some inside knowledge on communicate anytime if someone a human has to communicate with something that can't talk i think there's a there's a you're still coaching them they're still developing them they're still teaching them the training there's something there that they're doing really really well to get animals to learn and and improve without having to ever have verbal communication in the way that we do with another human. And that's how we got down this road. And that's why, you know, I think the other night when we were on the phone call and we were talking about downhill sprints and how a horse positions his body up underneath to break going down the hill. Yeah. But you brought up something interesting when we were talking that night and I never thought about, you know, the bucking horses at the NFR, them are some of the most unbelievable animal athletes there are. But then when you look at them, the NFR horses, which are the best in the world, they're a quarter horse a lot of times mixed with the draft horse. So they get the best of both worlds. They get all the power from a very strong animal, and they put it together with the sleekness of a faster animal. I hadn't yeah. thought about that much, and then you brought it up, and I was just like, you know, there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah, everybody wants the thoroughbred. Well, the yeah. thoroughbred's great, but almost everybody I know can ride a horse as fast as he can run. <laughs> Cause you just got to sit there and keep up yeah. and he's carrying you, yeah. but you, but you get on one that's coming out of that shoot and hitting and, exp- and, and showing you all this power, man, that's a hard animal to hang out and hang Different on. Different type to. of power too. Right. Cause they're, they're, they're expressing it vertically as opposed, well, not just vertically, but mainly vertically, uh, as opposed to just linearly like a, like a, like a draft horse, but right. Like, um, have you ever seen that movie, The Man from Snowy River? What? Would you, you can't ask a cowboy if he's ever seen The Man from Snowy <laughs> River. Well, it's in Australia. That's all I had to ask. But you were talking about downhill. Remember when that that horse goes downhill? Like, how cool was that scene? I mean, that's like that's one of the most epic scenes in horse movie history. Is is it really? Oh yeah. I mean, you see that stuff on all the time when he takes that horse over the side of the mountain. Yes. Yeah, and so. Horses half okay. I learned this from Tom Dorrance, okay. read, reading his book, and he's he's dead and gone now. But he had a perception into horses that most people don't have. So if you get a horse that's lazy in his hind end, and I think you'll see this in an athlete, they won't be using the muscles they need to be using. He would always say, "Ride a horse down a hill," and they have to use their hind end. Well, now all of a sudden they know how to use it. They're better stoppers. That's where the whole conversation come from originally. They're better stoppers because now they know how to use their butt and get underneath themselves. Oh, that's so I didn't know all that about it. Like, uh, when you were saying that and you're talking about downhill with a horse, I'm like, 
I remember that as a kid. My mom loved that movie. And uh, uh, I remember I remember that that scene like I can still uh, picture it. A horse has to figure that out very fast or you both are going to roll down the mountain. And he does that the first time. Right. Yes, yep. because the horse can't figure out how to get itself underneath underneath the horn. His feet should come up underneath the horn and then the horn should level out as they're okay. going down the mountain. So that horn should be riding down level. Some horses are better at it than others, but that I always compare that to athletes. Yeah, that's a good, good example. They got to you always got to level your body level your body to um your center of mass, right? Like right. And the the front feet in a horse don't do what people think. The front feet it's like a boat. They just go where the back end tells it to go. Mm -hmm. It'd be the same in the athlete. The front feet are like your arms. Your arms are only going to go where, where your legs are taking you. A hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. There's people read into that so wrong. Like the foot's telling the hand of what, what to do. It's not the other way around. Right. And then you were talking about, I compare probably way too much to horses for the podcast and the people that are listening. But, but what you said is, is very accurate you're dealing with something that can't communicate you. So all you can see is body movement and facial expressions and the way an ear twitches, how the eye changes, the way this foot steps. If you could just start coaching your athletes and not letting them talk and then not talking to them and just watching the movement and trying to figure out how to coach it, man, you open up a whole new level of how you're going to coach something. A hundred percent. That And like, so something I've been really working on the last, I don't know, probably 12 to 18 months is trying to coach with with questions as opposed or cue sorry, cue with questions as opposed to uh cue with directions. So like instead of telling the athlete to do something, hey, have you tried this? Right. So like we're talking about, hey, have you tried widening your widening your stance on a squat? Or hey, have you tried getting your shoulders over your knees? Um, because now I invite them to the party and it's their decision to make. And so then that opens up the dialogue to where they can tell me, hey, coach, I tried it. Come watch me. Or, hey, coach, that worked. Or, coach, I didn't like that. Okay, so let's go. And what didn't you like about it? Well, I, I just did feel weak. Why know why you feel weak? Huh? Do you feel your hips hurting a little bit? You'll, yeah. Well, we need to work on, on we need to work on that glute meat, right? Like, so now we're having, a, we're having a discussion about them getting there as opposed to me just telling them to get there, right? Because if I tell you what to do, then it's it's a one dimensional conversation. I'm just going to take what you tell me, and I'm going to apply it or not. But I'm going to go off of your best judgment. Whereas opposed to me and you having a conversation about it, you're going to decide that like, hey, you know what? You got me thinking here. Maybe maybe I am onto something, or maybe you are onto something. Um, and maybe I'll give this a couple tries to see if it's going to work or not. Now now you're also changing their mindset to be more growth more growth mindset about it and wanting to get better because it's a journey, like you were talking about earlier, as opposed to hey. It's not the destination. Where we are in week three is not where we want to be in week 11. Okay. We're on a journey throughout this whole thing. And you're trying to heighten body awareness. The only way an athlete is going to take what you're teaching them in the weight room to the field is there has to be body awareness associated with it. And I, it seems to be like your top athletes can take something from the weight room directly to the field and make it, make it pay off. So like maybe your top wrestler, the cleans. He might be able to take that hip movement of the clean right to the mat and lat throw a kid yeah. just because he correlates that where your kid that doesn't have body awareness, he's not going to figure that out unless you right. help him get there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And try and get, and, and, and I do think too, like we want the athlete to feel it, but I also think that we overrate feeling it too sometimes like to like, Hey, I know you feel it now. I want you to be able to apply it. I want you to be able to, um not think about it anymore because we want these movements to be habitual because you're going to be making tactical and technical decisions in your in your sport and i know you're not thinking about your running technique when you have a football in your hand and you're trying to evade a, and you're trying to evade a tackle so we got to get the we got now that you feel what we're doing now we got to make it habitual where you don't think about it anymore because it's just natural and this is this is the decision that you're going to make so you can make quicker decisions almost there, like an if then yeah there's a lot to that you know mm -hmm. that the longer you think, the slower you're going to be. Even if you're just talking milliseconds, that that matters at some point. At some level of competition, that's going to matter. Yeah, and just like you're talking about, whether it's horseback riding or whether it's uh or whether it's sports, your best moments are when you're in that flow state, when you're not really thinking about it. You're aware of everything, like you mentioned, but we're at the same time we're we're in the moment, 
but we're not we're, we're not like feeling it. If you, it's almost like you're in a cloud or you're not thinking about it. Like that's where we really want to be. And that's the that's the trick of it all is mm-hmm. is getting athletes there more consistently. Yeah, yeah, and trying to get so that's the fun part of the weight room in my eyes. How do we build competition and pressure moments for them to practice that? But at the same time, we make that stimulus just a little bit different every time so that they so that they are preparing themselves for any situation, but but at the same point, preparing themselves for that situation, right? Um, and when I say weight room, I don't just mean the weight room. I mean, that's any sort of field work we're doing, any sort of sprint work we're doing, any sort of uh, um, anything they're doing in practice, getting them to a, a state of mind where it's like, hey, everything's a chance for me to um, – learn and get better and a chance for me to take opportunities. Like again, with the filling of the bucket versus of, of lighting of a fire. Okay. We want that spark in them all the time because that's, what's fun. That's why they love playing sports. Cause it's, it is, it is a, a element of, of, um, of spontaneity. So I said, we were going to kind of wrap up. So I'll ask this one last question. <laughs> I've talked to three of you guys from Homewood. Mm-hmm. Pure genius. All three of, you guys how in the world were they able to assemble this staff i mean your your school is the envy of every other school in the country by putting corpus coach assisi and you all together what went into building that yeah um i'm the latest to the party uh because i'm the last I've, i've only been there for a year and a half um the the I think the biggest driver for the two is Nate Beebe, who doesn't go on any podcast. He's a head track coach. He's the one of the most humble people you're going to meet because he put like he's a sprints coach, and he put himself, he put he put he put a he put himself behind everybody to make sure that he could get a CC on board a CC on board at first with with Rob because Rob was a girls coach for the longest time. He brought him over, and then when him and Rob are together. He, he takes that step back so that he can get Corfist involved. And so you have this trifecta of three great coaches. And then our head football coach is our throws coach. And then what people don't know about is our distance coach, uh, Coach O'Donnell, has state championships behind his name when he was at uh, rival school, Creek Monee, just down the road. So they got an amazing track staff. And our girls is equally as strong. I'm really serious about that. Um, and they got five coaches that are all phenomenal. And so so where I came into play with this was uh, – my uh my uh, uh uh superintendent was at my previous school and like uh when he showed me the possibilities was here i already knew the coaching staff that, that was there um along with other great coaches like our, like our wrestling coach is great we have so many great coaches it's it's really a um we have high academics but it, but but a sports like we, we care about our sports we got they get great coaches in there they they know what they're doing with with uh, getting the coaches in there and they're very strategic about making sure they get the right mix. And so the, the, uh, not the athletic director, but the, um, superintendent, Dr. Wakely was like, Adam, you got to come up here. We don't, they had a strength coach before, uh, just because of where he's at in his career, his sons are playing, uh, uh, collegiate, uh, uh, baseball and things like that. And so he took a step back. He's like, there's an opportunity for you to come in here and help these guys. And also they'll help you. And that's what I, that's what drew me there was not only the, the opportunities that I would have, but to challenge me and get me to learn because like I, I differ, we all three, all of us, all of those coaches, we all have different opinions on these things. Right. Like, um, and so it makes it a nice mix. Like, like, like last year, our track athletes in season, our varsity track athletes didn't squat at all. We did Natera's ISOs along with some of the stuff Corpus wanted to do and some of the Caldeet stuff. And so I had to take a step back with my ego and say, Hey, we're not, we're going to try this. We're going to do it. We want a state championship, by the way. And I felt like I got to be a part of helping them with what they needed. Um, but what, but at the same time, not being a hindrance for them, right? Because I'm a service to the coaches and I got to remember that. But at the same point, I got to make sure that I understand what they're wanting to do. And so I'm not sacrificing my values or my, my, uh, my, uh, um, philosophies because i think more about principles i'm not sacrificing my principles we still did said principle we still thought about principle of reversibility so we made sure that we're sticking to the principles i have and i'm going to live off my virtues because virtues are things that i show on a daily basis i'm going to be relational with our kids i'm going to make sure that the coaches know i got their back and uh and and we have enough enemies as any sport coach you know this. like anybody 
we have enough enemies outside of us, right? The teams that we have to play and compete with. There's no, there's no way we can be successful if we're, if we're fighting, uh, if we're fighting on the inside. So we got to keep, we got to stay tight knit on the inside. It's okay to disagree. And I, and I, like I told him my opinions on things, we, I mean, it felt awkward at times as we're building this relationship and it still does at times. But um, what's really cool is, is we're, is we're all getting challenged. And I know that I'm getting challenged, especially with how to think about things. And maybe I don't always have the right answer. Um, and so there, we do know there's a lot of different ways to do it. It's just a matter of figuring out what's the right way for that situation or for that athlete, um, or for that team. Yeah. It, debate creates a lot of growth. If you're, if you're willing to stand back and listen to the other argument and not just prepare your own argument. I know the last few conversations with you, I've changed the way I have viewed a few things. You know, it may, it may not change what I do right off the bat, but now yeah. I have I have a way of looking at it that I may not have looked at it before. So without that debate and that little bit of back and forth, you kind of get stale. Yeah, yeah. And I'll tell you what, like, there's things that, I, that I'm that i not doing at the, at the school I'm currently at right now at Homewood that I did at my last school that were really successful because we're not ready for it. Like, like, people will think I'm insane. I snatch with my baseball players and we never had shoulder issues. And I can justify why we do it with the, how how the elbow, the wrist, and the uh, shoulder externally rotates, and why I think that it's why I th- why I th- think that, that it works well. But at the same point, like our our other sport coach, our other coaches, and our kids aren't ready for that yet. We we haven't had the time to train them how to do those types of things, and we might never have the time. I got larger groups here. Um, we have uh, athletes that are also um, starting baseball earlier, and so they might not even have the. We might not even be able to get them to that point from a strength perspective before we can do a, a dynamic, because really it's a dynamic overhead pr- press or catch really a dynamic over to catch. And they're not really ready for that yet. So there's things along those lines, like you said, where that there's things that I might, that I might want to do that I can't do. And there's also the things that like, I never thought about, like you said, where like, like, for example, I'm not a big person. I like compound lifts. Like we were talking, we've been talking mainly about compound lifts. I love doing compound lifts. I feel like, like we talked about the GPP perspective of that. But then also, okay, where does the specificity fall into there? And like one of the things we did with our track athletes is we did calf raises with uh, Kaiser, uh, air, the Kaiser calf raise m- machine in a seated position. Now, I would tell you to the day that I'm, I would have told you before this last year that like, hey, I get it. And I do think that I do see the improvement in it. But I would be like, there's bigger, there's bigger fish to fry than that fish. But then when we started to look at isolating that because we know how important the lower shank is for track athletes that their power output when they're doing those uh, with double legs started at about 600 watts and then we're ending it we're ending the season at somewhere between 900 to 1200 watts we made a difference in that and that's going to help their acceleration and it's also helping with that uh foot strength because we did it barefoot sometimes and we also did it with um alternating the legs so now we're firing firing back and forth with co-contractions so we're doing more with that than we ever than I would have ever thought we were when I first considered it. And um, I know Randy Huntington is the guy that we, that we got it from, uh, who tr- trains in phenomenal track athletes over in China and uh, Japan or China. I can't remember which one. I think it's Japan. However, I would have never thought of that had I not had an open mind about it. Huntington, didn't he train the Chinese national record yes, holder? That's who it was. Yep. Yep. And they yeah. are one of those things. Yeah, if you're going to go to China and you're going to train their athletes, uh, you better know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they know what they're doing. Yeah, the the communist countries seem to share a lot more information than the rest of the free world shares. That's what I always tell our um that's what I always tell our kids. I said the one good thing that came from communism and that's training periodization and all that kind of stuff, right? Like cuz they trained literally they would train guys to death and they would train all sorts of different ways to figure out what was the best way, right? So um that is one advantage we got out of content is for sure is that we learned how to train athletes in some respects. Well, coach, I really appreciate your time. I had a blast. I think we got to talk about some really cool stuff that, uh, maybe, maybe people can get something out of. Yeah. Thanks so much, coach. But thanks for that opportunity. You're doing a great thing with this and, uh, it's an unbelievable podcast and thanks for having me, giving me that opportunity to be on it. Well, anytime we'll, we'll sit down and we'll do this again. Uh, you have my contact information so we can argue any day you want to argue over this stuff. Sounds good.